Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. What's up, Josh? This is the only one you want to do? Mm-hmm. Well, it goes with yours. I don't have that one. <clears throat> oh. You watching any basketball tonight? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, that looks terrible. You got a bright-ass light in your house tonight. <laughs> got a floodlight on in there? Working on my lighting. Give me a second. <laughs> Must get the lighting. Well, when I have the lights low, it looks all terrible. Mm. Do that. Yep. Warriors fans go. talking big shit tonight. Oh, they won a game. <laughs> well, they only won because Draymond didn't play. Yeah. And I got so nervous when Kerr put him back in with three minutes left. I was like, this isn't good. I didn't even realize the plus minus was that bad. Oh yeah, it Kevon Looney in only twenty eight minutes had the best plus minus of anybody in the game. <sighs> yeah, Draymond was awful, dude. He's really, really bad. Yeah, he shot one of seven tonight, and uh, that 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 uh, I think that lowers his field goal percentage in the finals to like twenty percent. You know, that's. that's I think rough, it's Six baskets so far in the finals. Yeah. But he's he did other things tonight. He had like nine rebounds and eight assists or something. Hey, I don't know if you can see the comments, but a few people have said maybe your lens has a smudge on it, and that might fix it. <laughs> I don't think that helped. Probably the Android. Mm. Uh, but Curry was amazing, so... That must be said. I think he finished with 43. Um, they weren't getting – Wiggins had a nice game. I think Wiggins had like 15 boards or something. Yep. A bunch of offensive rebounds that really kept him in there at, in the end of the uh, third, early fourth. And then Curry brought him home. Thompson hit a few big shots, but it was the Curry show. Yep, Curry was great. Um, Poole was okay. Poole was uh... – Six of 13 for 14 points. You know, if they can get that out of him every game, that's going to be helpful. And then, you know, on Boston's side, Marcus Smart was a minus 17. Uh, Derek White was a minus 19. And I think that tells you a lot of what was going on with that team. I think White and Smart were good at points in this game, but overall they were making bad decisions. Yeah. I don't know how you went through that whole sentence without bringing up Tatum. He was awful. He had 23 points on 23 shots and six turnovers. And he missed two free throws. He's infuriating, man. He had one play where he had the ball in the wing and tried to whip one all the way across court with three Warriors in between them. I was like, I couldn't believe it didn't get picked off by all three players. It was like the stupidest pass I've ever seen. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and he played 43 minutes, too, so that puts that production in the, in a different light as well. He's shooting 34% from the field in the finals, yeah. Or tonight, so th- did he keep that pace up? Yeah, yes, 8 of 23 kept him right at 34%. Terrible, man. He, I, I mean, he's obviously a good player. That's why we're disappointed, because he's not living up to expectations. But he's just been really bad. Like, he was awful tonight, I thought. I thought he was the reason they lost. I think they... I think they have a better team still. I mean, Curry's obviously the best player in the series. But if the Celtics are going to win, Tatum's got to at least, you know, compete with Curry. He's got to he's got to be much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw a comment that just fucking got me. Uh <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And shit. <sighs> yeah, it's just I, I, it's it's tough. It's it's a tough. This this series has been like a roller coaster. Uh, you know, after game one, it feels like 
Boston has this thing locked up after game two. It feels like it's back to even after game three. Boston seems unbeatable. And then now, honestly, I think Golden State's never looked better just because it's a best of three with two home games. Yeah, I love how all the talking heads are like, you know, Warriors can't rebound. They're washed up. Curry's ankles hurt. This one's over. And then now they're going to be like, oh, it's the you know, the Warriors toughness, their championship pedigree, you know, <laughs> Curry and all it's like gosh just I wish we could just not proclaim teams the champion after every game let's just watch the series it's a seven game series Boston by the way has been 2-2 in each of the last two series and Mm -hmm. they were down down 3-2 against Milwaukee came back and won yep and they had to go to Miami on game set so like this is kind of right where Boston's been the whole time I agree. I agree. They, uh, they're they such a weird team. They'll they'll lose, like, a, a series-clinching game basically tonight because if you go up 3-1, unless you're <laughs> LeBron against the Warriors, you know, you're you're up 3-1 the finals you win. So they lose this one, but they, but they will – there's just as likely of a chance that they'll come back and win game five in Golden State. That's just how frustrating and random that team has been. Yep. They've been uh, – I just – there's, there's been so many good teams over the years. This year just feels like the year of not a great team. And I've I've kind of hinted at it recently with, like, the parity that I feel like is building up. And this year it looks like year one of that parity. Like, both of these teams don't look anywhere near a juggernaut. Yeah, I, I agree. I could have been a lot of different teams in these finals. So, but really fun series. And finally, a clutch game. It was the first clutch game that we had uh, all finals long. That turned out to be a 10-point win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. All right. Uh, well, let me welcome everybody to the crossover. Today is Friday, June 10th, and we've got a lot of questions to get to, a lot of uh, things on people's minds in this hobby. Um, but before we do that, do we have any announcements or, uh, ma- or mail days? Do you have any mail days? Nope. Do you? I do. It's technically an in-person day as opposed to a mail day. Yes, Christina? But we're going to be on um, the Great American Collectible Show on Wednesday. Uh, Josh, Christina, and myself will be on the Great American Collectible Show on Tuesday, which is hosted by Tom Zappala and broadcasts uh, on Boston Radio. As well as iHeartRadio, Facebook, and YouTube as well as uh, a number of other platforms, including wow. our radio and stuff. So that should be fun. Uh, but, yeah, that's about it as far as announcements go. And let let me take care of some mail days real quick. Oh, you son of a bitch. I know it's about to happen. You're about to pump this to the moon right now. Yeah, perfect timing. Perfect timing, <laughs> yeah. I am uh, I'm smugly having my way right now. Okay. But the first one I want to show is – uh, a gift that was given to me by a guy named uh, Stuart, who was at Bleecker Trade Night. We talked for a while, and I said, hey, that's a really cool card that he showed me. And he was like, well, you know what? He was like, you are a big enough nerd that you 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 should have this card. And so here's the card. It's from the very first in, uh, basketball professional basketball set ever made, 1948 Bowman. Whoa. And the card is of a play. It's a it's the it's a designed play. They have five of these cards in the 1948 Bowman set. And look, it's it's just a drawn up play. That's what the the top of the key used to look like back in the day. <laughs> so this this play is called the single cut using the post as a screen for, and then you know pick your player. So, yeah, 1948 Bowman, PSA 5. There's five cards that have a play written on them. So what do you think, Josh? You you in the market for – is this a play? What inning are we in of play cards? <laughs> I want to get all five, and <laughs> I'm going to maybe use these as an icebreaker to, to maybe one day try and bridge the gap between basketball analytics nerds and gambling guys and uh, basketball cards. And it's cool that it comes from the 1948 Bowman set. So thank you, Stuart. Really neat card. And then uh, we also didn't get this card for free. We purchased this card 
Um, and this is one of the reasons we went to New York. But uh, this is 2017 Prism Black, uh, one of one, fa Ooh, one of one, fast break curry. Uh, for those of you who like firsts, it's the first ever uh, Prism Fast Break Black. For those of you who like lasts, it's the last Prism Fast Break Black. So, yeah, it's it's probably next. Maybe maybe only above the 2014 Prism Black Pulsar in terms of the least desirable Prism Blacks that exist. But nonetheless, it's one of only about 10 or so Prism Black Curries out there, maybe 10 or 12. And it was just too too sweet of a card to, to pass on, especially at a really fair price. Shout out to Alex, who met us at Bleecker in New York to do the deal on uh, last Tuesday and shout out to him for a really smooth deal and a really fair price. Didn't they make cards with little circles on them later? Looks like is that fast break is the one with the little circles. Isn't there another? Yep. Yeah. So fast break has been going on since 2017 and it's continued, but this was the only black one of one uh, person oh. fast break ever made. They, they stopped putting one of ones in Prism Fast Break after 2017. So. The green five. Hmm? The green five is the lowest number then? Yeah, the neon green. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. And they call them Pulsar? Or, or no, it's like neon green, Fast Break. They're just the circles. Disco. Yeah, it's, they call it disco. it's called Fast Break or it's called Disco. Yeah. yeah. Or in baseball, they call it Donuts. <laughs> but it's not Prism. No, it's Prism. It's just a, it's a, it's a product configuration, right? So like you also have Prism Retail or uh, Prism, you know, Retail, you know, you, you have Prism Retail Boxes, Prism Blasters, you have Prism Fast Break. And the Fast Break parallels are the, you know, the, the Fast Break exclusives, but you can still get, you know, uh, the same base cards and stuff. So it's just a different product configuration, but it's definitely Prism. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not like Mosaic or something where, like, right, like right. in 2018, Mosaic was like a separate product that still set the word Prism on it. Right. Yeah. Okay. But it's not like Prism Black? It is Prism Black. It's a Prism Black. No, 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 no. Great one of one. Not to be confused with the Prism Black product. Oh, correct. Yeah, that, that the football product, not to be confused with that. And that is, that's very confusing. Like, here's a, here's a better example. You know, Prism also has a product configuration called Prism Choice, which has exclusive parallels like the Nebula one of one. And this is the same thing. This is, a, this is Prism, but the Fast Break product configuration. And this is the Disco one of one. So I, that's, that's probably the best way I would explain it. It's like the Nebula one of one is exclusive to Prism Choice. The Fast Break Black one of one is exclusive to Fast Break. This would appear to be the ultimate troll on you because you bought a curry card and I should be trolling you, but I, I really don't know this stuff, so I'm not trolling. <laughs> no, I mean, <clears throat> look, uh, don't want to say anything mean about curry. Uh, have done quite a bit of that. I'll do it for you. <laughs> yeah, jo that's Josh's mantle, but uh, I, I love Prism Black. I just think it's such a neat parallel, so... When I saw that card show up, and by the way, I didn't just like jump on this card. I sent it to like every curry collector I know who might have been in the market for it, and they all passed. So, oh. and I just kept thinking about the card. And I just yeah. kept thinking, like, except Curry Prism Black Disco One of One, like, yeah, I could do worse than that. You know how we have talked about it on random episodes where a card comes up and we both are like, man, I'd be cool to own that card. If this kind of falls into that bucket for you. Yes, yes, it does. Yes. And I just you can put to it that. Oh, go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, you put it next to your LeBron Prism Gold, the two that kind of, <laughs> the, the randos. The ones that don't belong? Well, I have two uh, LeBron Prism Golds. But uh, I, I yeah. really love a LeBron Prism Black. But I, I don't even know if I've ever seen one of those ever hit the market. So. Yeah, I think because I know where every single one of them is, and they're yeah. all one <laughs> Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> that would explain that. Yep, that's correct. All right. So let's 
take a moment and give a special shout out and thanks to Bleaker Trading for hosting us at um, the Sports Cards Nonsense Trade Night that happened on Tuesday. Shout out Mike and Jesse and Carvin, who was there. And shout out to Mark, Zablo, Jess, and Jacob for hosting another great trade night and making us feel not just welcome, but like family. Yeah, how was, how was that? It was it was great. You know, it was a lot of the clubhouse guys were there, which was fun. Met a few of them for the first time. Had already met others numerous other times. It was a lot of fun. I'll just say that. And it was great weather and just good times. I recorded a very awkward 15 and 60 <laughs> thing with Shay. And... Uh, you know, yeah, I just Zablo is such a great host. He runs a really nice card shop out there. And uh, yeah, man, it's, you, you know, you could do worse than spend a, spend a night out there in, in Manhattan and uh, hang out with some card people for a night. So it was fun. And the, the headliners were, you know, yeah, Mike and Jesse with Sports Cards Nonsense. And, you know, they, they were there. Carvin was there. Jordan, Fat Snacks Cards, who's launching his breaking business with, you know, he's, he's working for Bleaker. He's one of their rising stars, breaking. He was there. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's about it. It was cool, man. Did you end up staying in Tribeca? We stayed at the Soho Grand. The Soho Grand. So Sounds fancy. It was very fancy. And uh look Josh, it was no Atlanta hotel, okay? Let's just say that. <laughs> that's, that's bougie. <laughs> yeah, and uh stiff arm wax obviously was there as well, uh capturing footage. You know, he's been on Clubhouse lately, so he mm -hmm. <laughs> he's part I include him in that Clubhouse crew now. He's been building his own little like fan club following on Clubhouse. When he comes in, people get excited. <laughs> Yeah, South is always like, Nick, what's going on? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> that was very welcoming to to people into the chat of, of Clubhouse. Now, I've been joining Clubhouse more, a lot more recently. Um, it feels like it's more organized than the last time I was in. Like, the rooms seem to be more focused, and there's more organization and uh, fairness and sharing of the mic. So it seems to be better than the last time I was in there. Yep. Yep, it has gotten better. I think there's been a natural selection, too. <laughs> yeah. People that don't get to talk <laughs> stop going. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. All right. Do you do anything fun this week that you want to talk about? <laughs> Ugh. No, I, was, I went camping. And if you can't tell, I'm not much of an outdoorsman. Um, and we did, like, real camping, like tents and stuff. So, but it was for the kids, not for me. But uh, the kids had fun and... Never again, hopefully. <laughs> Lots of bugs or no? No, just like, not bugs, like flies, you know, lots of flies. I didn't, we didn't see any mosquitoes or anything like that. Uh, lots of like, you know, being dirty. There's like dirt on the ground and no showers. So <laughs> I, took a, I took a nice solo hike by myself. I went for like a four mile hike, so that was good. Nice. Nice. You didn't want to bring the, the young children with on a four mile hike? Nope. <laughs> All I right. bring one children on a one mile hike. <laughs> I'm tired. Let's go back. Were you near a lake or a body of water? No. Wow, just straight in the woods. There was. We went to a lake and did some fishing, but we had to drive to it. Okay. Gotcha. No fire in Arizona. Uh, you really almost can never burn open fires in forests because we just have such you know such droughts here and lots of lots of fires here we have we have a pretty bad record of fires and forests so you really can't ever burn an open fire so that stinks so it's not real i feel like it's not real camping unless you have a fire we did do s'mores though so there you go nice how do you do s'mores without a fire well we had like a stove top thing with a flame okay and do you plan again anytime soon Did you? How many Trulies did you consume? Mm, just four. Per hour? Oh, the whole time. <laughs> this is what I was telling you. I'm not. A, I. I don't drink that many. I don't. I drink them really slow. I'm 
I'm the, I'm on the first one. <clears throat> okay, got you. All right, look, we have so many questions. Let's let's start getting to them here. Uh, lots of market questions. Does that surprise you? Nope. No. All right, Ben X Croner one says, if we see a sustained dip in the price of sports cards, do you think mm. this will cause collectors to not sell their valuable cards, their more valuable cards? thus creating a circle of shitty cards being listed and selling for less and less while the good stuff stays locked up in collections. Too long, didn't read. Will it be harder to find my grails in a down market? My belief is that people who can afford valuable cards are less reliant on needing the proceeds of a sale to buy everyday goods. We have a smart audience. I just want to say that. We get some really thoughtful questions. I I think think you might have something to to drop on this one you were talking about last night in clubhouse yeah it wasn't really this though right like this is more like a general thing yeah well this is like a general thing of just like hey if if prices are falling you know no one's going to want to sell their good cards uh the the only reason anybody wanted to sell their good cards in the first place was just because they got too expensive to rationally justify keeping them right so if that if that's no longer feels like it's the case then the good cards are just going to go away. And I think that's a really good observation. It takes a lot to pry a good card out of somebody's collection. I think that's pretty much what he's saying. What do you think about that? I mean, it sounds good in theory, but I still am seeing a lot of really good cards hit the market. Just go look at the golden auction right now. It's mm-hmm. like, and that stuff keeps setting all time highs. So like, yes, it does. You know, those cards still sell for a lot. That Kobe credentials you pointed out, I had no idea that that card just is like the only Kobe card really that keeps going up. It's at like a million bucks, right? It's over a million dollars. Yeah. And so that, that's the thing. And that's a good distinction because the question asker also said like referring to a down market. Um, but if, if a card isn't going down, if it keeps going up, right. then there, there are some people who are going to still sell it just because it gets so valuable. So like, let's just very quickly, we're not going to review this whole auction or anything like that, but like, let's just take a look at sort of some of the opening items here you've got lebron uh both a gold exquisite rpa at a 23 bgs 85 which is well over a million and a half with bp uh leading the way you have the triple logo man uh at about 1.7 with bp and then the third highest card is this kobe which is at 840,000. it's the rookie credentials out of 499 psa 10 which is a population four and if you look at the mm-hmm. sales history on card ladder of this card You know, this card last sold uh, with Golden in October, so about uh, seven or eight months ago, uh, when the market was was stronger overall. It sold for $617,000. And that's the highest price this card ever sold for. Now, here we are. You know, the card letter value says this is about a half a million dollar card because the Kobe market's down about 20% or so. But if you click and look, here's what this card is at with buyer's premium. It's at 840000 with buyer's premium. You know, so this card is already guaranteed to set a giant record high. And it's going to completely sh- shatter the previous sale. So, Yeah. I mean, if you had to answer this question, do you think less of the cards this person's referring to are hitting the market? I feel like it's not. I feel like it's the same. Yeah, dude, we're, we're, st- we're still seeing – cards that honestly wouldn't hit the markets four or five years ago. Right. Like hitting the market now. (laughs) So like, yeah, I still think prices are so high that uh, there's still some collectors out there who have a hard time justifying keeping them. Just, I mean, if I still think cards are just wildly exceeding expectations over the last five years. You know, if you look at like the five year charts of everything, it's all basically like, you know, way, way, way up exponential of this. And then kind of like here, mm-hmm. it's not like it's come all the way back down to four years ago or something. Like some of these stocks have, <laughs> um, you know, like some of these stocks are, let's be sensitive to the mental health of uh, the stock bros. Some of these stocks are retreating back to like prices of two, three years ago. Cards aren't even anywhere near that two, three years ago, dude, we, we're like so far from those prices. And to me, it just, it kind of like, it really solidifies this as a real thing going forward, you know, cards as a 
you know, vehicle for spending large, large sums of money. I won't call it an investment, but a place where people like to spend a lot, a lot of money. It's here and it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it is. And uh, quite the contrary, um, you know, without uh, going down the rabbit hole, there's some pretty big reasons to be optimistic that there's going to be a competent institutional push, particularly from fanatics, but not only from fanatics, also from collectors, uh, the company, I call it Collector's Universe. I know it's not called that, but sometimes we talk, we use the phrase collector so much. Collector's Universe or Collector's Holdings. Uh, there's that. That's another big, you know, nine, ten figure style entity that's going to be and continuing to to push for the expansion and growth of this industry. So, you know, there's there's a lot of reason to be optimistic in the aggregate over the next five ish years. I think. Um, I'm with you, man. I, it's it's remarkable. It's just absolutely remarkable. Uh, what's what's what we've been lucky enough to see here. I, we, you know, you and I are coming up on six years, six year anniversary since we came back to the hobby. A couple of guys have been clamoring for this. Uh, they want to see this: the Anthony Edwards flawless rookie logo man autograph, one of one. Uh, this card is at two hundred and ten thousand dollars with buyer's premium that this card made josh take a giant swig that's incredible i mean that's an enormous amount of money for a super young player but so there you go it's like here's the card market i've totally like i said last week i've totally given up on fighting cards like this <laughs> you know, what am i gonna do people want to spend 200 grand on on that that's where we're at yeah right true enough all right. Thanks for the great question, Ben. All right. A uh, couple questions. Uh, good timing now anyway, since we're kind of talking about auctions. Uh, three questions about the LeBron triple. Uh, the first one is from Dillick Cards, and he simply asks, is the LeBron triple logo man worth all the hype that it's getting? You're going to make me answer first. Um... I'll answer first if you want. <laughs> It's a two-letter word. <laughs> It'll be a very quick answer. No, no, dog. That's a no for me, I... dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's – okay, so if you've been living under a rock uh, for the last few months, you may not be aware that there was pandemonium involving the hunt for this card, the 2020-21 Panini Flawless Triple Logo Man LeBron the best card in the product. And let's just say this, hats off to whoever invented this card, the product mm -hmm. designer or the creator who came up with the concept of this card, because it was th that it was like writing uh, a number one hit, a Billboard Top 100 number one hit. You know, they, they hit it out of the park. This card has, has tapped into something in the hobby and it's got people going crazy. And so Drake was opening product with card porn and Ken Golden trying to get to this card. Uh, you know, people were ripping through boxes and cases uh, on their own, as well as with breakers, spending increasing amounts of money on these boxes and cases. I think the, the, the cases which contained two boxes got up to maybe 45 grand at the peak, maybe a little bit more. So, you know, there was, there's a great hobby fanfare surrounding this card it, it definitely you know it has a story behind it there was an era that's associated with the card and you know it, it the hype just is what it is I, but but as a lebron collector josh where does this card rank in the pantheon of lebron cards like 173rd right that's that's kind of the sense that i get from it too it's just uh you know, it's very a big, in a big card. The fact that it's currently outbidding a LeBron RPA gold just absolutely is insane to me. Yep. yep. Absolutely crazy. Like, that card was made a, like, a year ago or whatever, <laughs> less than that. And the LeBron gold RPA is a rookie card. That's his, like, lowest numbered parallel of a true RPA. I don't understand it, but. Again, like what you know, that's that's what people want to spend their money on. I can't really do much about it. That's the market. I, to me, as a LeBron collector, it makes no sense. I don't understand it, but that's how it goes. Yeah, it's okay. You know, uh, we, we're allowed as collectors to value and prioritize different things differently. And 
you know, <laughs> it, I'm not saying that, that this car that this card can be comped because it's it's so unique. There's nothing yes. else like it. But if I were in the market for the card, you know, here's using card letter sales history. I mean, I here's something that I would start off with as a comp. This is the 2006 Ultimate Collection Logo Man autograph LeBron. It's I mean, autographed though. It, it and yeah, it is, and it's autographed. And you know, this is a third year card, and it's just I think it looks awesome. The autograph grade is a nine, so this is a BGS nine auto nine. Well, you know, last October, same auction actually as that Kobe credentials PSA ten. Uh, it sold for seven hundred seven grand last October, and this is a card where I think the the LeBron index is not applicable. I think that this card may be a million dollar card today, maybe more. But uh, still, you know, if I was if I was comping, you know, I'd, I'd probably look at something like that and say, you know, where does how does that line up with this? So, yeah. Um, another the value, apparently. I know. And then another another interesting comp here using the card letter sales history feature is this card. This is the 2019 Immaculate Logo Man one of one LeBron. No autograph on this card. I remember there yep. was a lot of uh, fanfare when this card got pulled. Not nearly as much as the Flawless Cripple, but it was pretty exciting. I think Jaspies pulled this card. Could be wrong about that. This sold with Leland's in April of last year for about two hundred grand. So, and I mean, these are fucking staggering numbers. These are these are unbelievable prices. So, the LeBron Triple is already at uh, one point seven four million dollars with BP. So, you know, look, there's. There's big money going after this card, and uh, I think whoever wins it's gonna hopefully be thrilled. <laughs> it's, you know, it's probably the highest profile purchase in the hobby in, in quite a while. So there you I mean, go. It's got the it's got the the uh, uniqueness to it of the three patches being from three different eras of LeBron's career, which is, I mean, obviously that's kind of the reason it's so popular. And we don't really have a comp to anything like that. So you know, it's played devil's advocate play the other side um that's clearly what you know driving the interest on this card it is is kind of a a one on one in the sense that it is a one on one card and also that you know there's not another card like that with three different arrows of of logo mans it's pretty neat yeah plus this card is being uh promoted in times square <laughs> so lots of visibility for this card look uh for better or worse that card is the biggest um card of 2022 i think is fair to say so, so let's get to the questions about the authentic yes we do so wax junkie museum says not wax museum but wax junkie museum says i'm interested in your take uh in your take on the grading process of the lebron trip why was there no numerical grade and do you think that there was a discussion or a negotiation between the card owners and psa it seems like it doesn't really matter what the grade is, which is maybe why they requested authentic only. How does it work with these super high-end cards? PSA advertises a $10,000 grading fee on cards with over a quarter million dollars in declared value. But if I owned that card, I would expect the grading companies to pay me for the right to grade the card. It would be graded by the highest bidder, and it's worth it for them for the publicity and prestige of having that card in their slab. All right. <laughs> uh, that's wishful thinking. Um, no, the person that graded it, or I guess the three guys, three gentlemen, right? They probably put in like min eight or something. Like they probably put in like min eight or min nine. And because it didn't meet, meet that minimum requirement, they just slabbed it authentic. I don't know if it was a discussion. Like clearly PSA knew this was coming to their doors. They knew it was a high profile card. So I would imagine there's some sort of discussion between the owner and and PSA, I don't, I don't have any inside knowledge on that. But, you know, the the discussion was probably like, hey, if this isn't an eight, slab it authentic. Now, what do you think about that? By the way, I'm showing on the screen the three fellows who hit the card in the break. Uh, the three of them together owned that spot, and now they're holding a picture of the card. Josh, how would you have graded this card? Or how would you have advised these guys to do it? I mean, I would have kept the number grade, but that's me as a collector speaking. Like, even in this case, if it was a PSA 6 or a 7, 
Well, I've seen the pictures of it, like, basically damaged, so that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure how that happened. That's probably another, you know, piece to the to the drama puzzle that is this card, how it got damaged. But I personally, as a collector, would rather see a PSA 6 than an authentic. Um, and I still think a PSA 6 would be better financially in this case because it is a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not sure, like, the authentic just looks kind of weird to me. I wouldn't want an authentic card in my collection. But um, maybe they were advised by someone to do this, and that's the decision they made, so I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you think about this idea uh, that I that, that occurred to me not, not so long ago? I mean, this is totally within the power of the grading companies because the grading companies could simply say, no more, you know, authentic-only grades. You know, mm -hmm. if you send a card in to get graded, you got to get a number grade. That's simple. And, uh, you know, would – would that hurt anything? Would it help anything? Uh, I, I'm not a fan of authentic grades either. Um, I understand that one of the major purposes of a grading company is authentication. Uh, but uh, to me, I think the transparency that comes along with providing a numerical grade is, is one of the important advances that grading brought to the hobby was telling collectors, especially when they're transacting cards online, telling them what the technical condition of the card is or giving a decent approximation of it. So mm -hmm. that, you know, whereas with a raw card, you know, you can obscure the pictures, you can hide damage, you could sell somebody a card that has a technical grade of maybe a five, uh, but you can make it look like it's a, it's a gem in 10. So to me, I think uh, it might be for the better. I don't think grading companies will ever do this, but it might be for the better if grading companies just stopped this authentic only slab uh, possibility and just said, no, you know, we're going to give it a technical grade and you know, it is what it is. What do you think about that? Do you, do you think the option should exist? It's a $10,000 hunk of plastic around it, dude. There's adds zero value in purchasing confidence. Like, great. It's authentic. I already knew it was authentic. What is it? Now you have to ask the seller what's wrong with it. Why is it authentic? Show me pictures of it. You basically have to treat it like a raw card. It makes no sense. Like, I don't even, I don't understand the point of it. Well but. said. All right. Uh, would you ever be so bold as to, uh, you know, because you know, like when people have cars that they're selling at auction, they'll say, I'm going to take it to this auction house and see what they think I can get and see what, what uh, percentage of the BP they'll give me. And then, but then I'll shop it to another auction house and see what percentage of the BP they'll give me. I'm going to, you know, survey all of my options and take the option that's going to be most lucrative for me. What do you think, would you ever be so bold as to take a card that you have and say, you know, to one grading company, what would you pay me to grade this card? And then take it to another company and say, these guys will do this, will you do better? You know, think of all the prestige that it will add to your grading company by having this card in your slab. I think maybe what you could do is, if I was to go down the path you're describing, I'd get bold and saying like, hey, I don't want to pay the 10 grand up front, but I'm going to send it to this auction company. Can the three of us work together to like take 10 grand off my payout and give it to you guys or something like that? How's that? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's so. Not, it's not like uh, egotistical enough, Josh. I know, you uh, want me to... The question Ooh. is they should feel honored for the privilege of the marketing of having the card in their slab. I'm not, no one person is above the hobby. Let me say that. <laughs> That's right. Nor That's right. one card. Let's say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. Uh, I don't think I'm with Josh. A, a grading company would never go for that and they don't need to. Uh, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, I found, I like the, uh, I like the the unconventional way of thinking. The chat is fucking cracking me up. Today. If you bought a card that you really wanted in your PC and it was a one-on-one and it was slabbed authentic, what would you do with it? Like you really didn't want the authentic slab, but you really, really wanted that card. It's some like Jokic black that you needed to finish a set or something, but you, you just had to buy it. What would you do with the card? I'd, I'd get a technical grade on it for sure. Have it. Would you crack it or would you send it to PSA and say regrade this thing, put a number on it? Definitely, I would not crack it. I would send okay. it to PSA and have them do it. Same. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like super easy. I don't even know if there's much debate. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe I don't, I, I don't think there's much debate there. Well, you could you could argue that you just leave it, but Yeah. Oof. Not for me personally. 
I can't even like imagine picture you ever having tr changed a card inside of a slab to another slab. Seems like you always keep them in the slabs they're in. Yeah, I do. Largely as a function. For that red. Except for the red. Except for the well, but remember, I <clears throat> the red wasn't a BGS eight. The owner cracked it out, and then oh. I purchased the card raw into I BGS eight. Yeah. yeah. If I had, if if it was in that slab, I would have never. <laughs> I, well, actually, maybe I would have. I I do think it's important because of PSA's guarantee to have certain cards I in PSA think holders. You would have cracked it though. I think you would have just crossed. It. I would have just crossed it. Hey Josh, we have a guest that would like to join. I think he'll be very happy to see this guy. Let's bring him in. We'll see. <laughs> just Thanks a lot for Josh to get happy about a guest on crossover. Just accepted his request. There he is. What's up? What's up? What's going on? I'm, uh, I'm so honored that you guys still accept my requests. <laughs> Why wouldn't we, Josh? What's wrong? I, I don't know. You know, who knows? People, people say crazy shit, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, for now, we're still accepting. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and you guys still run Card Ladder, and that's still a thing? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Nice. Feels feels that way. I'm still nice. working over here, Josh. They're still paying us. They're still paying us. I don't know why, but they're paying us. The the voice of God in the in the background from her is always the best. Yes, <laughs> Christina's still in the background. I can. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man. I don't know. I haven't like not talked about cards much lately, so I figured I'd talk about some. I don't know. What, what are you guys well, talking about? Yeah. Did you guys just kill eight minutes on like on PSA authentic? Is that what I just caught? <laughs> Yes, thank you for jumping in and saving the audience, Josh. Yeah, I was like, wow. I was like, this is – you guys are, are good, man. Fucking eight <laughs> minutes on PSA Authentic. Hey, can you talk about the triple logo, man, LeBron? What do you have to say about that card? Um, I think that it's a cool card. Sure. Um, I, I think that if you go five years from now and look back, does, is anyone really going to care about that card? I, I don't know. You know – like, it just, like, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of hype about it, and Drake got involved, and that's great. And But, man, to for what you else you can buy with that card in the hobby, like, forget about, like, what you can spend millions of dollars on external. Like, for what other cards you might be able to buy that are just, like, all-time iconic, you know, like, absolute, like, true grails. Like, I don't know. Like, I think I'd rather spend my money on, on that than, than a random card from LeBron's 19th year on, like – but, yeah, uh, so that's I mean, kind of look, look to the right of that card in the golden auction. In my, you know, the RPA gold out of twenty three, so much better of a card. Right, right. There, I mean, even last night, you know, on um, yeah, like you know, last night some of this stuff on all for like for fifty thousand dollars, I'd rather have you know some yeah. of some of the you know different you know one hundred ones that are out there. So, um, Ken's asking, is that? Oh, uh, that's Ken Golden's burner account. I was, I, I was really, really excited that Ken was asking about my nails. Um, so, so that's all good. Well, let's just pretend yeah. if it was Ken. What do you, what do you have to say mm -hmm. about your nails, Josh? Mm -hmm. uh, I think Ken would have. I think it'd probably, probably go good with with Ken's, you know, uh, Hawaiian shirts or whatever it is, <laughs> it is. Right? Yeah. What about my hoodie? Do you think I could pull off uh, nails with my, my hoodie? Well, you you and I have the same amount of hair, so I, I think you know that's that's the starting point. See, know, I knew I knew there was something handsome about you when you took off the hat. It just <laughs> thank you. We we do have that. Hey, can we talk about? Since I know you posted it, can we talk about? I'm a huge fan of your your Jokic purchase. I don't know. I don't really like to talk about that. So well, you did post it, so we <laughs> we don't have to talk about the the. Uh, numbers if you don't want but um, I think that I'm a huge huge believer right now that prism black one of ones in general are about as good of a card you can buy generally um, just because we're going to look back at like that prism era of cards and it's the best card of the best basketball set you know for and then Jokic is, is Jokic right he's an all-timer so um, I'm, I'm a fan I, I'm jealous I wish I could have bought that card well, thank you, Josh. I was being a bit tongue-in-cheek. I probably have talked about that card for about an hour uh, cumulatively over the course of this show, so I won't kill the audience with more. God, so, so, so what I was really doing is just 
um, highlighting my ignorance that I only watched the part about the authentic <laughs> and didn't and didn't watch the, the good part about the cards that I really liked. So. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That so, I mean. so you you talk a, a good game about Prism Black, but do. what do you have in your collection? Mm, I'm not at home. Uh, otherwise, I would certainly pull out some stuff and share it with you. But um, I did post um, during the uh, during Mint. Um, I posted my uh, Peyton Manning collection around that that whole story and the whole thing with Peyton and the cards. But in that um, in that Instagram post, which is still up, there's a 2016 Brady Prism Black one of one mm -hmm. that I actually paid the exact same amount for that card as I did for the entire Peyton Manning collection, <laughs> which is both a, a testament to, I think, frankly, how overvalued some Brady's have gotten, but also how undervalued I think Peyton's are, which is why I bought it. But like that card is like, I just, I love that card. And so I have 2016, 17 and 18 Brady black. Yeah, there you go. Um, one of one. So, and that's probably my three, at least most favorite, if not most valuable, um, 16, 17, 18 Brady. Okay. But oh. what if, so, so football is a little bit different because football, you just get the black finite one of one. Yep. In basketball, you know, in the last two or three years, you have the Nebula one of ones, you have the black one of one, you have the black shimmer one of one. Yeah. What do you think about, you know, the Nebula one of one? Do you put it on the same level as the black one of one? No, 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 no way. And did you see the, the 2019 uh, Steph Nebula stuff for like 144 or something oh, two yeah. auctions ago? Like, yes, eight. Yep, oh, I did. Holy fuck. You know, like, <laughs> that's crazy. Um I would thought that card, I was in there at like 25,000 and was thinking I might be able to grab it at like 25 <laughs> or 30. And right. then it was like, you know, two Steph fans. But so, no, I, I don't think Nebula or Black Shimmer are at the same level. However, um, I'm happy to grab one of those if, you know, if they're out there at the right price, just because it's still Prism 101. So it's nice. It, the Black Shimmer is an interesting thing, right? Because you made it black and then you go back and some of those mid years, right? Which is 2013 that has the, mosaic black and then or 14 i forget right so you have some of these that like which one because there were two the two kobe came up in in uh it was like maybe three months ago at golden it was 2013 um, black and then black uh, mosaic and i was in on both of them and the black went for like 190,000 or, or two 220 or something and i bailed out and then <laughs> i picked up and i picked up the mosaic for like like 28 or something Right, so like a, a difference of like ten x between the mosaic and the others was a uh, yeah there it is mm -hmm. right um, was was to me it was a no brainer to be able to to grab that card so yeah uh, yeah that that card's awesome congrats on that here's the other one you're yeah. referencing this is just the the straight up black one of one right and the picture's crappy because it looks like it's a silver yes it does it, yeah. it's not dark enough it's it's. Yeah. And but then, what, sorry, yeah. what, Chris, what, what were the exact numbers that they went for again? So the one, the, the PSA 9, just the, the true black one of one, went for 206. 206. And the 9.5 black Pulsar went for 27.6. Right, that was mine. So I bought the Pulsar, and I, I bailed on the, the other one. Small discounts. <laughs> right. Small discount, yeah. So, okay, right. so you've got some yeah, okay, black finite versus true black. It's... It's a, but it's weird because football it is the true black. It was. I know. It's not like, there's not like there's another one. So I know. And but which one do you aesthetically like better, right? Because I I've got some black finites of McCaffrey. I've got some black one of ones. Which one do you think looks better? I've got an opinion on this. I kind of like the finite better. Me too. Yeah, I kind of like the finite better. Um, however, then knowing the the deal the deal in basketball, when I see the black black and it's kind of you know it you know how it is like. Therefore, therefore, you like it more because you see it next to the black shimmer or whatever. But um, but it's weird that they did that, right? And didn't keep it consistent between yep. the between the football and basketball. Do you, by the way, do you have any idea why they did that? No clue. Yeah, yeah. Panini does a lot of random stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you'll, a, maybe you'll uh, have some say over that sometime soon. Or or at least you know maybe I'll work with the people who know the answers to that at some point who knows maybe yeah. one or the other yeah yeah speaking of that josh uh any Ooh. big industry news that you might have on the cusp here relating to fanatics or anything that you can share with us um 
uh, there was a college football deal that was announced. I assume yeah. I assume that's what you're talking about. No, I look. I'm just anything you want to break live oh. at, at midnight uh, Central Time. Uh, um, no, there's not. There's nothing to to break. Um, I'm I'm in New York City uh, for a wedding, and my wife just went to bed. And frankly, I was just bored and um, thought I would talk to you guys. I haven't talked cards in a while. There's there's no news. The college football one is, I don't know. Like, do you guys think that's a big deal? The the the, the, college, the college deal. Don't know what that is. What happened? Um, look at it uh, up real quick. Fanatics announced, um, you know, tops uh, college deal. So um, this was a a an aggregate deal where they were collecting a lot of college players' rights, and um, and then so there'll be tops um, college cards. Oh, nice. And so I, I don't know, like, is this interesting to you guys? I think this is good for the players. Right. Is this part of, like, the NIL stuff? Yeah. I think yeah, it's I mean, we don't collect the college stuff, but it's interesting, like, from the perspective I, of the business and the market. Right. I don't either from a personal standpoint. And, you know, we've obviously seen massive delta in value from, like, for example, Prism Draft Pick product where they're right. not wearing, you know, NBA jerseys to, to that. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting. I, I haven't been um, highly involved in this, um, you know, in the future. We'll, we'll see. Um, but so I don't know. That, that's the latest news. There's no other really big news to announce. Nothing that, that is um, definitive and concrete that would be worthy of an announcement. Well, why haven't you been in cards? What have you been doing? Mm -hmm. No, no, I was just saying I haven't been, I haven't been deep in that, in that deal. Oh, no, but you said earlier, you said you haven't been, you haven't talked about cards in a while. What have you been doing? Oh, I mean, I haven't talked about cards live on air with anybody. I don't know. I've been, you know, you still got to show up to work every day and, you know, answer emails and sit in meetings and do all the, <laughs> do all the really fun stuff that, you know, people, people think that, that, uh, that your whole job is sitting on, on stage at, at Mint with, uh, you know, with you guys and telling stories, but they know that it's really about uh, emails and meetings and cleaning data and, uh, you know, and creating indices, right? Like that's the, that's the real job. Oh yeah. Although I will not let you downplay the creation of indices. I, I'm not downplaying it. I'm, okay. I'm saying it's, it's, uh, it's not sexy. We're the only people that, that find it, you know, <laughs> I, um, uh, I gave a, pre I gave a presentation at, um, uh, at, at, um, last, or I guess it was on Monday of this week. Um, it was for Bloomberg, internal company offsite. It was a couple hundred people. They asked me to come talk about, um, you know, kind of just my his, my story and entrepreneurship and, and all this. But in the Q&A, they started really pushing me on sort of how Campus was formed and some of it. And I stopped and I explained to them, I was, you know, for 18 months, all I did was clean Excel data for 18 months. Every night after work at IBM, I, that's all I was doing. You know, and I was like, you never in a million years could have thought of that this was going to happen from that. But it's like someone had to do it. Like that was the work at the time in front of you and you have to do that to move forward. And, you know, that's the reality of a lot of this stuff, you know. So I appreciate it, man. I, I love some indices more than anybody. So, <laughs> Josh Johnson, I've asked so, too many questions. Mm -hmm. Let me pass the uh, mic to you. You guys, are, you guys are all excited about your prison blacks. I wanted to know where you <laughs> rank the prison black Fast break disco pulsar uh, and the pantheon uh, of the prison black world. Before you say anything horrible, just know that I just picked this up, so that's why he's asking you that. Well, that's a pretty sick card, um, okay. and it's Steph, and it is Steph, right? It is. Yes. Yeah, um, and that that's a pretty sick card, and I'm happy to talk to you offline about buying it. However. Um, <laughs> A true collector, bargaining on that one. You know, um, it's um, it's just clearly a, a, a rung lower, and it's pretty frustrating when someone has a, a black disco or something and is trying to get the same money as everything else. I'm a, I'm actually in the middle of of a of a crappy negotiation. There's a there's a uh, Mahomes 2012 select black disco on on eBay that the guy is asking for more than I paid for for the base oh. for, you know, and I'm like, I've showed him the historical sales on all of it. I have the other ones. I have both of the, the bases. Um, and I, I would buy it in a second if you would sell it anywhere near the other ones, but you know, 
So no, it's clearly a step down, but um, but I still collect them and, and will buy them. So yeah, I, I, what's what's your sense of the state of the market right now, Josh? As as a collector, but also as somebody who looks at data, somebody who's got you know uh, a hand in a lot of different silos of this industry. Yeah, you know, I think that we are we being fanatics are a little bit to blame that we probably could have been doing more to market the whole industry over the last six months. And it wasn't for lack of, you know, desire. It just, you know, integration of any companies when you do an acquisition is, um, there's just a lot of work internally that is just not. Um, and, you know, we, we bought tops and there's a lot of stuff to do because there was a moment, what, a year ago, you know, like after the, after the crash, when it came back down, there was still a, a tremendous amount of, of demand and interest and people that were there. Um, and we've basically been flat from a, 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 I don't have the data on, on people in the industry. I don't think anybody really does, but it feels like we've been flat in that regard. Doesn't feel like we've had a lot of new people coming into the hobby over the past year. And a lot of that is, is on us. Like nobody markets the hobby as a whole. It's going to have to fall on us and PSA and the biggest companies in the space. Um, and so that, that's for all of us to, to, to continue to do that because the same people aren't going to all of a sudden buy 10 times as much as they buy. Like it, it just, that doesn't work. Right. I mean, you can't just keep selling to the same people. There are plenty of people, flippers, by the way, if you've been buying other black cards, you see it as well as I do, which is, like last night I bought the John Morant 2020 Prism Black on Alt's auction. That same card sold on Golden's auction a month before. So whoever bought it on Golden turned on and sold it on Alt, right? Like, <laughs> I, see this all, I see this all the time. Like, it's a one of one card. Like, I know where the cards are, are moving to, you know? Um, so between the four platforms, between eBay, Alt, PWCC, and Golden, like, that stuff happens all the time. Of just trying, people are trying to move it until it falls in the hands of the person that wants to own it. In that case, me. I'm not going to sell that card. Um, and so you just need more people in the hobby period. And, you know, that's going to be at this point, we're all going to have to make a concerted effort to actually market the hobby, market our own businesses to do that. Because just that, like the natural wave of, of everything coming in, like that's not going to happen again, right? Like now it's going to be work to do that. Yeah, that's the card. It sold, I forget whether it was Golden or, or PWCC and I let it go. And I think, and then I ended up buying it last night for, I think I want to say maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven, seven thousand less than it went for the other one. But like the person bought it and literally turned around, flipped it the next month on, yeah. on a different platform, which let we see all the you, time. Let me teach you something about Alt's business model. They bought it and then they immediately listed it themselves. Right. Actually, that's right. It that right. They, that makes they take multi-thousand dollar losses every time they do that. Yep. That's right. It was golden and it sold for thirty four eight on April thirtieth. And what did I pay for it last night? Twenty three four. <laughs> yeah. So. Not bad, Josh. Not mm -hmm. bad. That's such a sick card, man. Yeah. Can you just chill on this these prison blacks for a little while. Let some of us minnows swim in this. How many prison blacks do you have? How many do you have? Just give me a number. I don't know. If I was at home, I would go. I would go look it up. I don't oh, know. No, no, ballpark it. I'm not letting you get out of this one. Ballpark it, like <laughs> very 50. convenient, and, and nothing's with him. Everything's at home. I I probably have like a hundred. Is my guess. Okay. But I have very a lot. Good. I have a lot of comments. Right. I have a lot of like I'll I'll pick up a comment for fifty bucks, hundred bucks, you know, hundred fifty bucks, um, stuff like that. My guess is probably about a hundred. How many of those are ones where like you notice that it comes out of your bank account? Not a common. Not common. 20? 25? That's a lot, dude. That's a lot. I mean, if you really, like, yeah. add them all up of all the, like, really good players and all their blacks, you know, you got a pretty decent chunk of them. Yeah. I, I mean, I would love if I could evolve my collection to be basically all of that. I mean, I would still hold on to 52 Chops Mantle and, you know, 52 Chops Maze and, and you know, a handful of, of those type of cards. But like, I would love if I could evolve my card and just keep selling off other stuff and, and move into that. It's just, it's just cool shit, you know. I didn't coordinate this, by the way. Did not coordinate this. Not has, it, this. has this been a? But the flip side is, every time I then I have the conversation because I, I appreciate having just a nice, honest conversation about this stuff. 
And I'm like, fuck, now people are going to run up on Prison Blacks. Mm. And, you know, it's like, it's like what happened with the Kim Kardashian card. Mm. You know, after I started talking about it and posting it, I told you, you know, you, someone was asking like 60, 60, 1,000 for the card on eBay. <laughs> and, I, and I messaged the guy. I've told you the story, right? And I messaged the guy and, I, and I'm like, yo, I'm like, the last sale was $1,200. Like, what are you doing? He's like, no, nah, someone really important in the hobby said it's going to be a big card. I'm like, yeah, me, motherfucker. Like, I, like, just a, like, I'm the only one trying to buy this card. Really? <laughs> <clears throat> you know. Josh, what are your three most coveted Prism Black one of ones that you don't have? Well, there's zero chance I'm going to buy it if it shows up. But I had six cases of 2018 Prism Black that I kept opening because Luca hadn't been pulled, or at least mm -hmm. we don't know if it's been pulled, right? Um, so I mean, that's that's it. Um, you know, I know who has the the Mahomes. Um, oh, and, we all know. We all know, do. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time um, trying to work out a deal um, with him. We came really close a few times. Oh, um, wow. And, um, but didn't. Uh, and I think you probably know he also has the, the trout, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 2012 trout. And so it was going to be a joint deal, um, which would have been, uh, which would have been great to, because that, I think that one's a, a month or two. Um, what else? Um, I don't have any LeBrons. You know, <laughs> we were talking we're, about that earlier. We we're talking about that one. That's there's a reason for that one. One guy yeah. owns all of them. Right, right. Um, like everyone, right? And um, but I, I'll say other than other than that, um, in specifically, I'm really I really like 2018 uh, Prism Blacks, and both both basketball and football, and so. Uh, those I've been trying to buy as many as I come up and select. Um, I think I don't, no other, no, no optic or, or anything else, but I'll buy select blacks too. Cause I think they're, um, I don't know, just the select blacks are nice. Right? So. Those are kind of like the black X fractors, right? Kind of. Uh, or like the field level court side. They're like the yeah. black and the yeah. X fractor yeah. pattern. Well, it depends on which, which year they've, they've changed it up a couple of different years. Um, it got weird, right? When it, when you hit twenty and select, all of a sudden started putting like way more one on ones in there. It became less yeah. of a hobby product and and stuff like that. Um, so once you get to twenty, you got to be careful and only buy you know the the court um, you know the field like the three base cars as opposed to to all the others. Uh, that was actually one of like the kind of like leading charts in the white paper was about the just like crazy increase in one on ones from. Um, you know, from uh, to Anthony Edwards um, in that that trade. So, but what about super fractures, especially with the fanatic tops thing? What about top super fractures? So, I'm more of a fan of the platinum one of ones, um, and um, I just think that they look good. I I grabbed the uh, someone put the Trout 2021 tops platinum one of one just for sale on eBay like two weeks after the set came out, and I think I got it for like. Twenty eight hundred hours, um, which, like, I I paid twenty grand for the twenty eighteen platinum one hundred one, right tops. So this and and maybe I overpaid a little bit for that one because <laughs> it's trout and but I mean I for for less than you, you can look it up on eBay which I'm sure you're doing right now. Go look up the the twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two whatever the most recent top set is. This is twenty twenty two tops. Platinum one on one Mike Trout. This is the problem of talking to fucking you guys. Every like price price of that, you know. You flip it around. Yeah. What was it? How much? It went for fifteen oh two yeah. sixty eight. Or fifteen twenty six, sorry. All time steal. Look at that. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Now is there much shine or luster to this card? Mm -mm. No, but how do you feel about mm -mm. it? Do you like the mm -mm. shiny or no? No, I'm I'm okay with that. Like it's it's platinum. It's understated. It's you know you just know that that's the one one for tops. Like it's top flagship set. Yeah. It's a, it's the one one. You know. Right. So super factors are cool, but you know you're in baseball, so it's like how much you know just how much you know how much money you really want to spend on baseball versus. Well, I was thinking like. 2009 and earlier top super fractures like old stuff yeah yeah That's some of that I, yeah i you know you, you started to see some of these like tops finest 
one-on-ones have been coming up a lot. Um, there was one on that I was watching last night on all that I didn't buy. There was a Kobe. Um, yeah, like that's that's pretty badass. Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty badass for sure. Where was that one at? That's yeah, with Leor. Oh, he owns that one. Yep. Is um, is there a price on that? What do you mean, like a value? Like, no, the last sale. Yeah, there's a last sale. The last sale was two hundred and sixty dollars in January of two thousand nine. <laughs> Damn it! Damn it to hell! Where was I that day? <laughs> Wasn't Here's great. LeBron too. Right, now it's a ten. Here's the LeBron of that too. <laughs> hey, so are you moving off of um, uh, onto like Jokic as a a full PC alongside McCaffrey and no Jordan? And... No, it, it'll always it, it's like it's like Jordan, Luca. McCaffrey and then Jokic it was just I'm a new fan of Jokic we'll see we'll see how much I like collecting them but we went Christine and I saw him play game three in Denver versus Golden State and I really liked watching him play in person we'll see we'll see where it goes oh that reminds me for sure my best my favorite black collection is I have almost every MB 2014 black um, I don't have the base. I don't have the actual black, but I have every other prison black and I have two select blacks. Um, and being a Philly fan and Embiid fan, that's been my goal. So um, I'm hoping to shake that, that last one loose from Pharaoh, who I, I don't know who has it. So I love that. I think Embiid is a really fucking awesome player. Yep. yep. There's the one you need right there, isn't it? Yep. That's it. Damn, that's, I, I love mm-hmm. that year of prism. Show what that sold for in 2020. That sold for about eight grand in 2020. Mm-hmm. Just message PWCC and say, hey, who bought this? Track it down. I take it you won this when it hit eBay recently? Yeah, that one's mine. Sick. Yeah. Sick. There's, there's... I can't keep up with all these goddamn black. Photo variation black? You guys in your one-on-ones. <laughs> that year, there was a lot of weird ones because there was the mm. pulsar, then the photo variation, the photo variation pulsar, then the, there's a the freshman phenom one. So mm. there was actually a, a bunch of them from, from Prism. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's Embiid, it's, I don't know. So, but I, I'm, I'm very jealous of, of you, Jokic. I was. So. <laughs> Thoughts on. Uh, uh, Philadelphia's unceremonious exit from the playoffs this year. Um, do we think that the play, the finals matter anymore for cards? Is if t- if Celtics win, is Tatum gonna move at all? Oh, we, I, well, I don't know. I, Are I, you shaking I, your head yes, and you're shaking yes, your head no? I'll is that what just happened? I'll, I'll take the affirmative case on this one. Oh yeah, you're gonna hear nothing but talking heads jerking off to Jason Tatum on every major network for the entire off season. The hobby's going to glob onto that. I think it's huge for Tatum, personally. Okay, go ahead, Josh Johnson. What's your Disagree. The other side? Disagree. It's too late. Four games in, and the guy hasn't had a signature game yet. He's barely going to win finals MVP. Jalen Brown is leading this team in scoring. Even if, he, if, if the next three games, let's say go seven and he crushes it and has an amazing last three games and wins finals MVP, it's just not like it was 18 months ago, which, by the way, is, is I'm not saying it's a bad thing, right, to have that level of volatility on a game or series or, <laughs> or finals right. basis. Um, but I don't know. Like, is it is it already baked in? Does it mm. – I, yeah. I, I don't see it, it changing much. Um, I would love it to. I have a couple big Tatums. I don't have the black, by the way. Um, but um, but I, have a, I have a 2017 gold Tatum, which is – you know, I'd like that to be worth more money, so. Yeah, oh, yeah. well, look, man. Here's Tatum's total market index. It features 252 <laughs> cards. This is his index over the last two years. There's not a ton of charts in the hobby that look like this, but this is what Jason Tatum's market looks like. So, yeah, I mean, when you say baked in, yeah, I mean, I think there is some baking in. His market is 5X over the last two years, but I don't think it's how – t- How tight is that last that last <laughs> jump? What what month is that? Yep, yeah. go to the no, go to the bottom of that little rung there, like right in the right at the bottom of that before it jumps up. Where is that date? Hover over this it. date right here. Yeah. Yes. So before it takes this gigantic leap, that's February of 
this year. So it's fast for they turn the team around. Like they sucked in yep. December and January, and then they they made their run up. Yep. So two yeah. big jumps: one jump in February and one in late March. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. I agree with Josh though. Like the run up has occurred in anticipation of him making this run, and the run has already happened. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was listening to a podcast with uh, Brian Windhorst, Tim McMahon, and uh, Tim Bontemps. And uh, McMahon came out, and this guy's a bit of a curmudgeon. He came out and said, I don't think we're talking enough about Jason Tatum. I think Tatum could be one of the all-time greats. Look at what he's doing under the age of 25. Here's, the, oh, here's all the other players who have scored at least 1,500 points in the playoffs besides Jason Tatum. And it was just – it was basically like LeBron, Kevin Durant – Kobe, maybe one or two other guys. So I'm telling you, there's a narrative forming. If Tatum wins the finals this year and he gets finals MVP, you will be so sick of hearing about Jason Tatum by the time the next season starts. I, I still think there's a lot of uh, hype yet to come here. So I don't disagree with everything you said except for its impact on pricing, right? Like will the, the media who need stuff to talk about in the offseason basketball talk about um, you know, Tatum, sure. And like, is he making that jump to being a, a, a superstar? Sure, right? I just don't, I don't think that we're going to see a, a massive change in, in the value of his cards. I would like it to be, but <laughs> I just, I just don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Right? Well, all right. So, how about this? His NTRPA PSA 10, which is a pop three. Um, this beautiful card here. Are you a fan of RPAs, Josh? Nope. I, 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 I own none. <laughs> okay, well, this card mm. went most recently with Golden for 193 grand. That's, that's pretty strong. So, you know, I think there's definitely something to the idea that there's not much room up from yeah. there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I, and I agree with Motor City Wax said that, that super high end is, is different, right? Once you're at that, that level and it's so rare, right? What did you say? It's top three? So, top three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah true. Yeah. True. true. Who are you rooting for in the finals? <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to root for the Warriors, but I spent four NBA finals sitting with the Cavs owner. Um, and rooting against them. And so I, I find it hard to root for the Warriors. Um, but as a Sixers fan, I can't root for the Celtics. So now I'm just rooting for cards. And so, you know, I would like to see Tatum win MVP and, and go up because Steph's cards are already where they're at. So, yeah. yeah. Josh and I have been hate watching both teams. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, our preferred outcome is maybe – both sides voluntarily quit the season ends, you know, without you know, I need the, in a draw. In a I need the Warriors. To, I need the Warriors to flame out. I'm with Josh. I rooted against them for so long that it's just like ingrained in me to root against them that I want them to get pummeled. But it's not not going to happen, obviously. All that said, Steph is just just unbelievable and just the just absolute pleasure to watch. And when he hit that 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 running floater with like five minutes left or whatever. It was just like, oh, this game's over. Like he's he's not letting them lose this this game, and and it's pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, but it still it's like, I was there for. Um, I was sitting under the basket. The I was sitting in the on the floor in the seat directly under the basket. The J.R. Smith, um, brain fart where um, <laughs> where uh, where George Lynch missed not George Lynch George uh, Hill missed the free throw. And JR, like, I couldn't have been closer to him, you know, for that game and stuff like that, for game one. And if he makes that, LeBron doesn't punch the wall and break his hands and they win game one. And who knows, maybe they end up in its 2 2 in, in series, not 3 1. So, um, it was a charge, by the way. Fucking, that was a charge. That Kevin Durant foul was the reason they lost, not the stupid JR play. <laughs> well, but, yeah, there, there were, yes, there, there were definitely other things happened. But, and if George Hill makes the damn free throw, George Hill got right. lucky that. JR had right. that blunder because he gets attention away from him. <laughs> That's right. LeBron That's had right. 50 points in that game. 50 against the super team. LeBron was unbelievable. It was it was it was the most amazing game I've ever I've ever seen. And um and then he goes and literally breaks his hand. He punch, he punched the whiteboard and broke his hand. <laughs> Josh, what's your best LeBron card? Um, oh, I got lots. I got lots of them. Let me just go. <laughs> Not you, JJ. You go first. 
No, I couldn't resist. No, I he, everyone knows. Go yours. I was joking. Um, what's my best LeBron card? Um, I have a uh, Topps Chrome Black PSA 10, um, which it's, it's continued to fall, which is not good. I, I, you know, I, look, long term, that thing's going to be great, and all the LeBron stuff's going to be great, but it's been cr- pretty crazy how volatile that, that card has been generally. Um, yeah. But there's got to be a card that I like more than that, though. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't. This is why it's like. A, this is way more fun to have. Like when I'm at home, I can like flip through rock boxes and mm-hmm. and look at that. But um, yeah. Um, if, yeah. Good. No good. Well, I'm just all over the place. But uh, what what's on the horizon for Zero Cool? We've got the Jackass cards that came out and did well. Obviously, the V Friends was a huge and controversial lightning rod release. Yeah. Um, have you noticed the zero of zero card in Jackass? Yeah, that's the, fucking uh, cool. I, I the, like that. That's clever. The purple zero of zero. So there's <laughs> you know, there's two one of ones. Uh, you know, I'll let the the market decide which is the true one of one. Um, but <laughs> um, the disco. <laughs> right, right. Um, we look. Every set will end up being different based on who we work with and partner, or whatever. But for sure, that is the, the, the theory and the strategy moving forward is that there'll be a zero, zero and a one of one for all sets and the zero, zero will always be, will always be purple. Um, and, um, and I don't know if you saw, cause I think I just posted it as a story one day, but um, I was able to, to get the, the giant Knoxville, someone who pulled the giant Knoxville card one, yep. zero, zero, hit me up and let me know and, and let me buy it at a pretty reasonable price. Um, so I own that one <laughs> and I bought the Tyler, the creator, um, black one of one, um, who I think is going to long-term be the most important person in that set because he's the most culturally relevant person in that set from all that. Um, so that's a, a side note as we're still just talking about one of ones that, um, but um, yeah, look, it's, there's been a, a little bit of a, a hiatus. Um, we knew that was going to happen. Um, just the nature of, of, card printing and getting production spots and, and all that, which is a frustrating thing. I mean, shit, like prison football just came out. Right. Like, um, yep. and so we're not, we're not immune from that either, but um, hopefully we'll start seeing some more sets. The next couple of sets, I think we, we might announce them at the national. I think that's probably what's going to happen. Um, we'll have an activation at the national and, and we'll probably have um, some cards, if not a whole set and announce them. But you'll start seeing some more traditional IP, um, TV and movies and, and stuff like that before we come back to more uh, directly cultural things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and I guess to announce something, um, as opposed to being completely, um, I can say that there's definitely something happening with Stranger Things. We'll, Ooh. See, we'll see exactly what that looks like is, is TBD, and, and we'll let that still be surprised for exactly what it looks like. Um, but yeah, um, so... That's um holy that's shit. Pirate. That's fucking yeah. that's kinda nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Christina yeah. tripped up. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. taking requests. Yeah. For sure, always. Oh I mean, okay. I guess what Josh is gonna request. I can too. He said it in the mint video. Oh. Go ahead, Josh. Oh okay, well yeah, that that's the one in the mint. I said Nickelodeon IP. I think that would be really sick. Like you can't do that on television and have an, an RPA card of a slime. <laughs> yeah, like, fucking, like I don't rats, know, mm-hmm. Rugrats, like you know, all Nickelodeon. That's all I'm gonna say. The other one is The Office. Yeah. Oh yeah, The Office would be amazing. I would love to to be able to do that. I would fucking buy that shit. I you know I didn't buy the other two, but if there was Office, Dwight Schrute one on one, sign me up. Dwight yeah. Schrute zero of zero. Andrew Andy Bernard. Oh my god, I'd go nuts for that one. <laughs> like this is the exact purpose of of all this, right? Like yeah, you're not a Jackass fan of E Friends, no problem, right? I know you're going to buy every other NFT set we put out, but other than that. <laughs> Dude, I would buy the office. I'd buy the box. I'd be ripping it. I'd try right. to buy some of, the, some of the good ones, like the gym autograph. I would do that because, dude, yeah. that, yeah. Exactly. And, look, we're not uh, – we, we don't have that in our sites right now, but, like, for sure I would love to do that set. That would be amazing. Be, and by, there's so many big stars in that as well at this point. Yeah. How many people have gone on to just be mo- have monster careers out of that? Like, but also, like, 
that'll be the fun thing as we start to do some of these early series. Like imagine if we had done the office in like season one mm -hmm. where, you know, nine of 10, nine out of 10 of those people were, were unknowns and to go on now you look back and be like, have, you know, Steve Carell's rookie card or whatever it is. Right. So. Mm. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. That's pretty exciting. Uh, no dentist sets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you get that from me? Is that why? So I didn't know that you've been on this dentist kick for, for however long. And, yeah, too and, long. Too long. Tell me about it. And Ace hit me up yesterday or, or <laughs> earlier this week we were talking. And she's like, by the way, she calls you Chris Hodge. And I'm like, and she's like, yeah, why does Chris Hodge always talk about, about, uh, about Dennis? And I'm like, hold on. Chris Hodge? Who are you? Are you talking about Chris McGill from Carla? She's like, yeah, yeah, but you know, his, his handle is Chris H-O-J. I'm like, you know what that stands for, right? Anyway. <laughs> so she called, did you know this? That, is, do other people call you Chris Hodge? Oh, yeah. A few. A few? Okay. All right. Well, that's ridiculous. Um, but so anyway, she brought up, she's like, does he, why is he always talking about Dennis? Is that because of like that joke you made? And I was like, I don't know. Is it? You know, I can't pinpoint when the dentist take over the hobby happened or when I became aware of it. But it has happened, and it's uh, it's it's reached it's reached a point where I have to speak about it publicly. So if anything happens to me, there's breadcrumbs that have been left. You guys know who did it. When all of his teeth are missing in one of the episodes. <laughs> By the way, uh, who just I can't see who said it. Someone just said anti dentite. That's fucking amazing. That's. <laughs> Um, I'm not against the dentists. I'm just uh, I'm I'm saying that these guys have a lot of great cards, and uh, you know. But, <laughs> but this is this is because of the the because I, I I've made this joke like a million times and things where right that that's what this is from right. I, just yeah, be clear. So you're clear. I, you're you're making fun of me, right? That like that's what this I'm is. Not, it's no, okay. I'm not making fun of you. Uh, this is a real thing. Ask people. Do a survey of ten random people you know in the hobby. Three of them will be Dennis. That's all I'm saying. Or a child. Ask him about kids in the oh, hobby. Oh, don't even get me fucking started about these kids. This guy is like a kid hater. He hates little kids because they buy up all his cards. Look. I'll, I bet you if you add up all the kids under 15 years old who own Prison Black, they probably, out, they probably yes. outdo you. They would outdo both the both of us with ease. Dude, way, that, Mac that, Jones. A thirteen-year-old kid pulled that Mac Jones Prison Black one of one and sold it for a hundred grand, and now he's probably bidding on some other Prison Black that I need <laughs> with his new cash. With his new cash, yeah, yeah. But my my theory on the the Luca Black is that it was pulled by some kid in 2018 when boxes of of Prism were four hundred bucks, and it's sitting in the back of his closet. And he thinks it's a big. The, the kid is now is now 17 years old or he let, went away to college and the cards are still sitting there and he has no idea that it's sitting there and we may never find it. Oh, that's the worst of all worlds. It's going to be like the Goodwill LeBron, but it'll be like the Goodwill Luca one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so you're going to be at the National. You're going to be at Atlantic City. I'll be at the National. I'll be able, I will even show up and, and leave the poker table and come in and go <laughs> to the thing this is the problem with having any card shows in in you know vegas or atlantic city or whatever so um yeah um i will be there are you guys gonna have a card ladder activation yeah multiple activations we'll be uh out the, two, of the two you guys sitting at a table is not an that, activation. that is activation that's <laughs> that's a lot of activation Josh, I don't think you understand how much planning I have to do to get both of them in one location. Fair. Yeah. Fucks. <laughs> <laughs> she has to go, she has to do a lot of work to, to make me happy on the planning side because I like planning and she has to do everything to plan everything for Chris because he hates it so much. It's just a nightmare for her. Yep. And it's just complicated stuff. Josh, I don't know how you step in the middle of this relationship all day every day <laughs> I'm not close. yeah what do you think about atlantic city are you looking forward to the national being there or not so much it doesn't matter where the national is like the you know the national is the the national like look atlantic city actually um is 
a pretty cool place if you like casinos. Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of really good casinos there. Relative, I mean, after Vegas, it's the best place in the country. Um, and um, but it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's, it's you have everyone there from the Cardinal Street. Doesn't matter where you are. So it'll be fine. It'll be I'm great. Glad you didn't call it Nationals. I if I had yeah, a dollar for every time someone calls it Nationals. Yeah, that's a weird thing. <laughs> Yeah. I've seen experienced people call that. I'm like, haven't you been in the hobby for 10 years? There's no S. This isn't a dance party. This isn't a cheerleading yeah. competition. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I like that it's on the ocean, too. I like being on the ocean. I like the boardwalk. Walk, yeah. yep. There's – um, so, you know, I, I grew up in Philly, and so Atlantic City is the closest beach. It's the closest, um, you know, casino. It's like an hour door-to-door. And so um, – there's a lot of really good restaurants down in uh, um, Margate and Ventnor. Um, there's a lot of like, there's actually the best turkey hoagie ever is, uh, you know, is down there at, at Dino's and Margate. So like, there's, there's a lot of like, you know, saltwater taffy if you like that. There's, there's good shit down there. Um, but all of us are going to stay in, in the, just buy cards all the time anyway. So, you know, look, it's close enough to, um, are people complaining because there's not a major airport and you have to like? Yep. Is that the yeah? I can and like that. the hotels are a little bit far from this where the, you know, the national field. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, but it also just has the history, right? Because I think the first national I ever went to was '91 mm. in Atlantic City because we could drive there from, and my father drove me down there and. That was the first time I ever saw, you know, so many people in a room, you know, for a car. Every every car I've ever gone to before was, you know, I don't know, 50 table or something like that. And it was just like, yeah. you know, as a 13-year-old, I was like just blown away by that. So Nationals, like, you can't really picture that many people being obsessed with this really weird niche thing in your life. And then you show up and you're like, wow, all these people like looking <laughs> right. at the piece of cardboard like I do. This is weird. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, what do you think about the need for um, whether it's Fanatics or the other companies in the space to start um, like leveling up the national and, and adding more than just the, you know, look, we're, everyone's there for the product. Everyone's there for, for more cards and you can never find anywhere and to find that, that grail. But, you know, we're in the middle of planning for this and, and going to have an activation that's going to be way different than you've seen before. So I don't know. Is that, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is it going to be awkward? Like, what do you think? Go ahead, Josh Johnson. Um, yeah. I mean, you're talking to like your collectors who kind of like things the old way to That's a certain why. extent. That's why I'm asking you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but Chris and I feel pretty, I'll, he can insist, he can answer too, but I feel pretty strongly about like marketing being, you know, the next big key aspect to the hobby growing. And I, you know, you obviously know that is the answer as well. And the national is a big part of that. And so being able to get people in person and using that as a big marketing push for, you know, expanding the hobby and growing the hobby is important. And so what that looks like in practice, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly. Um, I hope it doesn't mean, you know, making it sell out too much with, you know, uh, celebrities and cheerleaders and stuff that doesn't really relate to cards. But I think growing the, the national, making it bigger is probably – probably pretty important yep ditto uh the more fun the merrier so i yeah go for it take risks i think uh i yeah i i but but you know the national there's there's a there's a very high floor on the national experience like mm-hmm. it, everybody who goes loves it so it's it, it's not going to get worse but yeah if you do something creative outside the box a little risque i, I think that's only to the good just uh Josh, I know you know this because like, AC won't let you do this, but no girls in bikini tops, please. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, Josh, I just worry about like the infatuation with people and celebrities in this hobby and like the desire to lean into celebrity culture and, and making that the launching point for growing it. Whereas I think what Chris is saying is like the floor is high. All you can do is just, you know, make the national bigger, more cards, more trade shows, trade nights, more. No one's going to complain about that, right? Like, we already know that works. So just more of everything would be better. Yep. Yep. Good. Um, I know I, I agree 100%. Um, there certainly will not be, at least if we have anything to say about it, there will certainly not be um, girls in bikinis or, <laughs> or, or guys in bikinis or, or any other uh, form of naked people. Um, but, you know, when you look at some of these other 
industries like Comic Con or Complex Con in, in the sneakers or streetwear fashion world, um, the activations that brands bring into those places are there's a commerce angle usually, but it's really around creating an experience that the people that are there are going to feel a certain way about and they're going to want to post it on Instagram and they're going to want to talk about it and they're going to want to make it so that everybody who can't be there wishes they were there. <laughs> and it becomes this, this marketing, you know, cycle, right? And that's how you bring in new people to the hobby, right? You're never going to be able to get everybody in, in the same place, but you can, everybody can watch on Instagram. Everybody can, you know, can be engaged that way. And, you know, the, to um, someone just, uh, Paul Raz just said, celebrities are a great springboard for bringing new eyes to the hobby. How we, we leverage those celebrities, uh, that's the key question. Having, to your point, Josh, like going too deep and having it too much of a, of a celebrity culture can certainly be bad. But man, we don't leverage, like the way the National just puts all the autographers back in the back corner. Yeah, and that's true. Like that's not a good use of that either. Like there, there's, a, there's right. a medium in between there where it's like, hey, if you're coming to sign cards at the National, you should be required to have one social post, yeah. right? Like yeah, at least, right? Take one picture with one person or whatever and post it of like, if you just had just one from each of all the people that come there and get paid to sign, like how many more people are then exposed to trading cards in the national and stuff like that. So like, this is, you know, what we, I think we have to be thinking about it as we, you know, to your point, you know, use this as a big marketing uh, point. Well, did you see, I don't want to, this isn't like a, anything about me. Did you see the thing that with Larry Fitzgerald was, you know, I, I helped him buy a card and sort of brought Larry. I, I caught like just a, a quick like post or a quick a picture of it. What? T tell me more. Yeah, no, he just like he's been wanting to buy his own cards. He has some connections through collectors. They connected him to me because I live in Arizona and I was helping him buy some of his cards. And he just seemed really genuine about it. And he really was interested in buying his own cards. <laughs> like his excitement in buying his own cards was similar to you and like the Prison Black stuff where like you're in the industry but you also really like the cards and he, he just gave me those vibes where, you know, he's got a toe in the industry. He's obviously an athlete, but he also seemed genuine and like, no, I want my cards and I want the best ones. So awesome. the, that part of the celebrity culture does interest me. And I think if, I think what I meant by that was like, it needs to be genuine. Like the people that are the athletes that are signing at national or the people that are going to be involved, the celebrities, they need to be genuine versus, you know, we just hire this celebrity just to like be the face of this thing. And, you know, they don't actually give a shit about cards. I, I mean, it's a really good point, particularly because there's enough people that either are genuinely interested or yeah. will be when they understand it, that we can find those people, right? You have, first of all, how many athletes should, should have a, a similar experience to what you had with Larry Fitzgerald to at least open them up to be like, Hey, did you know that your cards are worth X? And then, you know, you right. can, like, you know, when uh, before I went on stage with, with, with Peyton at the Mint, um, you know, we met backstage and talked. And 90% of the time we were talking, he just wanted to know about the, the collection that I bought. Right. Him, right. And, you know, what were the cards? What years were like he was he was genuinely interested in, in that stuff. So, yeah, like that's we, we, we should be doing that. And, and um, uh, you know, I think this will be the first year that we start to see that at the National. And then hopefully <laughs> it continues from that. And this thing's like you know, mint continue and, and other card card shows. I mean, there's a shitload of card shows these days, right? I mean, I'm yeah. sure you guys have been tracking it as well, but um what I, what was it was it the week of there was I don't know, there was some big show that people were talking about. It was the one at Fenway Park. Um mm -hmm. but that weekend we counted there were nineteen card shows in the country that weekend. <laughs> like like that's nuts, right? Like when's the like the last time it's been 19 card shows a week, it was had to have been like the 90s. That's all right. So, like, so that that's good. I mean, you know, obviously, that's not sustainable every weekend, right? But like, that that's good. That's what we want to to bring more people in. So, but hey, anyway, okay. Well, uh, well, do you have any tips? Like, number of people are starting to think about the national, how to best make use of their time. The national. Do you have any tips that you would give to collectors going to the national, especially somebody going for the first time? How to make the most out of the experience? Yeah, I mean, if you're, you have to have a plan. Like, if you don't have a plan, you're just going to get fucking destroyed. <laughs> like, you're going to either spend all your money in, like, the first, like, you know, four tables. Or, like, right. it's just, it's so overwhelming and it's so much fun. And 
you know, um, and there's so many things. The other thing I would say is if you have a collection, um, there's no better time to try to trade out of stuff that you don't want hmm. because there's so many people that are there and so many dealers are open to trade. Um, you know, last year I probably traded more than at the national, I, I traded more than I probably have in all of, of my collecting life because it's, it's a hassle to trade. Um, yeah. but at the national, you just have, there's a lot of a opportunity to, to be able to do that. Um, so I guess those are my, my two points, have a plan. And, and if you have cards, you want to trade, um, not a, not a bad place to do that. And, and then, then put trade nights on top of that which have become even you know, easier to do that. And I'm going to guess we're going to see twice as many trade nights this year, if not, yep. if not more, right? So yep. you're going to yeah. see a lot of them. Yeah. Um, are you guys or is somebody going to organize the information around trade nights? Because I felt like last year it was hard to know exactly what was happening when, where, outside of the regular programming. And I don't see the people at the National doing that. So there's a, a lane there for someone to organize that info. I mean, yeah, you asked about, you know, how to use national as a springboard for bringing them. I think that's, that's another great idea is like making it more organized and taking more control as the central piece of it. I mean, Chris will probably be all over that side of it, spreading the word on who's going to be where and what events there are. He's pretty good about that on the stories. Are you guys going to sponsor a trade night? No. No, Chris and I are, we prefer not to be tied down to any, like, uh, I feel like you're the same way at the National. You just, like, every time I see you there, it's one of my favorite genuine moments to just see you there having fun, not not tied down to any specific, you know, business and or uh, responsibility. Well, yeah, I doubt that's going to happen this year. That's why last year was, was amazing because no one knew all the stuff that was going on. And so <laughs> I, I intentionally was like, I'm going to be here for four days shopping, not doing shit. I have no obligations, no meetings, no nothing. And it was amazing. And I know that that's not going to happen this year. Um, right. And that's just the, the nature of it. But, like, that's the fun part, man, to just be able to be there and go around and, and see what you want. So I, um, I envy you. I'm glad you should definitely operate that way. Yeah. So, well, let's, I've, uh, I've commandeered, commandeered your show. What's she saying? The voice of God has spoken. She says, don't say? worry. She's got, what did you say? You have everything have scheduled? All of their schedules set. Like, they're not actually going to be open and free. She wants you to know that this we're not just total clowns. We do have schedules. That's, that's breaking news. I didn't know that. So, there you go, Josh. I have plans, apparently. I'm in charge of things. I have to do things. Mm -hmm. that, look, we, we, all, we all have to answer to somebody. You guys yeah. answer to her. You know, <laughs> yes, we do. It's fine. <laughs> It's fine. Um, you said, why, how do I get in the middle of these two? I don't. I'm, I'm at the same level playing field as Chris, and we report up to Christina. That's right. <laughs> smart. Smart. You know, no, know where – look, we all have to play politics in our, in our, uh, our work lives, right? When, when, right. When, hey, when Ruben says jump, I jump. That's how it goes, right? We just – you know, we all do what we do. So, uh, Christina, but, uh, Ruben, same thing. Yeah. Yep. Look, I, I've, I've commandeered your show long enough. I appreciate you guys letting me come on and hang out and talk. Um, you know, as always, it was fun. I will um, text you after this, Chris, and try to buy that Steph Curry. And, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't try, but uh, yeah. shoot your no, shot. I, I, I've, I've gone down this path before. Um, <laughs> yes, I, you have. <laughs> I need to let, I need to let that one marinate for a little bit, and then we can, we can circle back. But anyway, it was good talking, guys. Christina, yep. as always. Bye, John. See you. See you. Okay. Good. There we go. All right. Well, wow, we've been, we've got through about three questions. We're on a roll. Well, I'm fired up about national now. Oh yeah. Well, look, let's talk about national. There are some questions about national. All right. Uh, Josh uh, painted a picture of national that made me really want to be back there again. I'm definitely bringing cards to trade too. Any anything that like I'm not 100 percent attached to. I'm I'm sticking it in a Zion case or a Pelican case. Zion case is the one the dealer set up with. Who do we sponsor these days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Okay. Uh, let me. Just let the question. What am I allowed to say? <laughs> You're allowed to say whatever you want, Josh. I'll deal with the ramifications later. That's the best. Whatever that 
little setup is that you just described is the best. <laughs> or she like message me while we're on the live, like stop talking and I just all right, fine. She's you know. All right, well, let's talk about the national a little bit. I'm I'm scrolling through the questions, trying to find the question about the national. What do you want to say about the national? I'm more of a brown box kind of guy. I love those little brown boxes. They're just so much easier to carry. That's that's all I gotta say. Okay, like the little brown boxes of PSA sends back. Oh, I love those. Do you remember when I made a post about that? It's, uh, South Zane sent me like 50 of them. <laughs> I have so many. <laughs> I literally have like 50 of those things. They're amazing. Uh, well, the question was, as I try to find it, the essence of it was what tips do you have? Yeah. And what, what do you have aside from what uh, Josh Luber told us? I mean, you know, I've done this like tips video thing for four or five years now and three or four or whatever. And I feel like now that I'm wiser and I've been to so many, the number one thing is just like, don't have any expectations and go into it. Just trying to have fun. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like you really don't know what's going to happen and it's going to be overwhelming. Try to plan planning. Definitely. It will help you. But like the biggest thing is for me is like, go and just be open to whatever's going to happen, whatever, you know, events come up and center it around having fun and being around your friends. Yep. Sounds about right. You? Uh, get some sleep. Get some sleep. That was needed after, like last year. We did not. That's my mistake. That was my mistake last year. Yeah. There's a trillion different ways to enjoy the national. To be honest with you, uh, I think the best tip is just just get there. <laughs> just get there. Just make sure you go. Don't don't let you know, fear or, uh, oh, I'm not going to know anybody there. Or, I mean, yeah, that is scary. And that is going to be a little bit frustrating at times, but just get there and make the most of it. You will not regret it. You will not, you'll not regret going other than that. You know, the way I do the national is just, I just completely free ball it. And, uh, it's, yeah. it's worked okay for me. <laughs> I think I tried to not, I've tried to plan every little night, every single night, every hour, and it doesn't work that way. You got to free ball it. <laughs> yep. You got to go commando. <laughs> All right. Let's go on. Um, thoughts? Okay, this comes from RJ Hampton Cards. Thoughts on the new eBay vault. Will this bring in more international buyers? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of – it's more fun, I guess, to, like, make fun of all the vaults. But, like, you know, it doesn't – I mean, just because I don't use it doesn't mean it doesn't benefit somebody. There might be some – that's a good point, like, bringing in more international buy, inter, international people that may be wary of it otherwise that don't want to have to ship stuff across seas. Like, it could be a beneficial product for somebody. Mm -hmm. A lot of incentives to use that vault as well. Uh, you get to, I believe – um, save on fees, yeah. Save on fees, save on sales tax. Yep. Um, save on having to ship it to a CSG to get verified. Yeah. Do you? Well, I'm pretty sure it will still go to CSG before it makes its way to the vault. But once it's in the vault, yeah, right. Then, That's yeah. the point. Once I think once you have your inventory, yeah. they would just like transfer it over. I would imagine if you if you buy it from someone who's already had it. You don't think when it's in the vault and it goes from account A to B, they take it out, they ship it to Florida, knowing, CSG looks at it, and they ship it back? Knowing no, no, no. I wouldn't be surprised. I think the biggest thing is that they're going to use the vault to get some of their big seller accounts to actually keep their inventory in the vault, and then that will save them with through the incentive of like, hey, we're going to save you on a bunch of fees. You won't have to ship to all these people. We'll handle everything. Just keep it in the vault. You're going to sell it anyways. I think that's a big – that to me is the big – positive it's like i'm already going to sell it so it's not really it's not my collection that i'm you know i always thought having your vault in the collection wasn't really for me but if you're going to sell it anyways it kind of makes sense yeah <clears throat> which is you know one of the things that you know pwcc gold and all these vaults offer anyways but for, for ebay it's different right because it, it is the biggest marketplace mm -hmm. yep uh yeah sounds about right and look you know ebay executed uh rapidly 
and effectively with their authentication program shortly after announcing it they've stuck to their timetables like it's happening it like sometimes in the hobby we deal with i'm going to do x y and z and then those things never happen well ebay says it and they they do it so i like that point i'm glad you called that out yep and so uh, this vault thing is happening and it's 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 an interesting uh minor disruption to the way of doing things and i it'll be interesting to see how it plays out uh, our hobby was if everyone in this hobby did what they say they're going to do, that's a better, we'd be further along than we are. <laughs> yeah. Plus, you know, this is really, man, this is such a, uh, this is such a ground zero right now, or um, a T zero on the timeline. Like this is T zero where, you know, there's just so many new things taking shape. So many, uh, ideas getting flushed out some succeed some fail we're going right. to see businesses and ideas fail over the next one two three years we're going to see others thrive we're going to see adaptations but we're like we're, we're casting the mold for what the hobby is going to look like over the next five ten twenty years that mold is being cast right now yeah. and uh, we'll see if the vault model works we'll see if multiple vaults is going to work or if there's going to be a concentration to one primary vault, it's like one vault wins and the other vaults lose, or if vault yeah. can share market share. This is just such a uh, an uncertain, interesting time for these decisions to be being made. But you know what? One hidden blessing is of the fact that we're in a period of high inflation and we're in a period of economic. There's likely going to be a recession announced because Q1 and Q2 very likely have had negative GDP growth. And you know what's good is that these ideas are being tested in a market that isn't just strictly up and to the right. These ideas right. are being tested in a, in a volatile mixed market. And that's the right laboratory to test business concepts. So you, you, bad ideas can be glossed over and look good when you're in you know, a total bull market but in this mixed market this is the right market to test these ideas in. completely agree i mean i have the opinion that if you have a really good product you have a really strong team that executes that product you stick to what you say you're going to do you're going to be successful in any economic environment if you have something people want yep and to your point like we had this period of everything up and right so every every company was successful we had mass amounts of you know seed money investment money pouring into these companies that had no business taking that money on and you know a lot of them failed and we'll probably continue to see more of those fail in the next year like you said um so that's a good call out <clears throat> fun question here from uk baller cards imagine a standard trading card size did not exist so we don't have a standard size for cards <laughs> Or at least, you know, you're, you didn't know. You have no idea that cards are two and a half by three and a half inches. So what would your ideal card size be? Starting from scratch, how big would you make cards? Well, it's really hard to remove my brain. It is. <laughs> it's super hard, so I'm going to try my best. I was thinking the shape of a phone, like a little bit taller and a little bit skinnier than the current format, just because we're so used to that. But I got to say, man, I really like the shape that we have now. Yep. I don't like the, I was thinking, Oh, what if it was a square? I feel, um, nah, that's just too weird. Like it doesn't fit in your palm, or your hand as clean as the, you know, the rectangular taller one. Yep. I think they nailed it. And there's a reason that it's the size that it is, but I could see if I, if my brain was able to do that, I could see the shape of a, like a, you know, an iPhone or an Android, a little bit taller, a little bit skinnier possibly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. A strange question. I thought about it for a little while. I, I really don't have an answer. I do, but what I can say is I do like the size they are now. Good handheld items don't take up too much space, etc. So, You've seen the, what's that Jordan, the Interlake or whatever, the promo? Yeah, like, too big. every time I see those, I'm like, nope, too big. Yeah, same thing for comics. Um, way too big. Vinyl, Video games are huge. Yeah, vinyl's way too big. It gets too skinny, too tall. Yep. It, it can't be too tall can't or wide, like dimension-wise. It can't be too, and it can't be too thick. You know, I just, 
the the slab can't be like four inches thick, you know. It's just is the do you is what percentage of the reason that cards are better than all those other things? And that's the fact. <laughs> it's just based on the like dimensions of it. Probably not zero. I think I think it has a lot to do with it. I think it's more than we'd be willing to admit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something as stupid as the size of the object is like the. Big I mean, that's that's important, man. It is. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, this was uh, this was gifted to us at some point. This is a comic. National last year from Chrissy. Bucket. This was from Chrissy Buckets at the National. This is a graded uh, Bloodshot number one. That's pretty cool. It's shiny. It is shiny. But, you know, and then compare it to a uh, a slab. Yeah. yeah. Plus, like, this, we're really getting into this. Josh was making fun of us with the authentic thing. Oh, we're going to get even deeper on this one. The card being that small, like, you could always just put it closer to your face and make it bigger. <laughs> but it has to, you know what I mean? Like, I could... You get so much value out of how, and it's and it's it's not really three D, so it's just two dimensional. So you don't really need it. Doesn't need to be thick. There's it doesn't add any value unless it's a jersey card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just so uh, moldable. You could do so much with it. Yeah, right on. <clears throat> I agree. This is cool looking. That's a cool looking book. It is cool looking. I went through my PC on Flickr, and I was gonna count how many cards i have that don't have anything shiny or holofoil involved and it's like two cards <laughs> <laughs> which two it was like a random like chris paul exquisite that didn't have any holofoil on it and then like one of my penny cards like the one one of my penny cards doesn't have shiny to it like one of my jersey cards mm. i think i need to sell those two cards now <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, have you watched the movie Hustle yet? And if so, what are your thoughts from Dillick Cards? It's on my list. I'm going to watch it. I'll watch it this weekend. Yeah, me too. I'll watch it this weekend too. Do you like Adam Sandler movies? Or just Adam Sandler in general? I fucking love Adam Sandler movies. Dude, you should listen to the podcast with Bill Simmons. Did you listen to that yet? Yes, I did. Well, I fell asleep listening to it, so I got about the first 15 minutes of it. <laughs> I love Adam Sandler. I mean, I was I have a lot of nostalgia for him. I'm sure you do too. Just given our age, like yep. the peak the peak of his powers when we were younger, and um, so to see him like having this like Clint Eastwood kind of career where he's making like more serious movies at the end, and not not the Clint Eastwood, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yep, he kind of changed as he got older. He kind of changed the movies he made, and I just I think it's really pretty pretty impressive from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he's Uncut Gems. You liked Uncut Gems, right? Uncut Gems. I'm gonna never do that again. <laughs> I, I loved Uncut Gems. Great, great movie. One of my Uncut Gems is my favorite movie to come out since it came out. It's the best movie I've seen since it came out. So whatever it was, two or three years ago, I guess. It's the best movie I've seen that came out since. Well, I've heard really good things about Hustle. So me too. People are were saying uh, stop everything you're doing and go watch it right now. The yeah, Edwards apparently is really good in it. Yeah, and Herman Gomez, I heard, is good too. Uh, get your Anthony Edwards prisms. Herman Gomez is the main character. Yeah. Uh, it's, I forget his first name. It's, there's two of them, right? There's the brothers, right? The, yes, that's correct. There's so I think he's the one that's not on an NBA team right now. Mm, okay. All right. Uh... <laughs> that flawless is because of hustle. <laughs> <laughs> that gold, the one in golden set 200K because of hustle. Maybe. Wancho. Uh, Wancho Herman Gomez. Thank you, Chet. Wancho. Fuck. <clears throat> There's some really deep questions here, but I wasted a lot of brain power when we talked to Josh Luber. You know what I mean? Go ahead. No, no, I'm ready. No, I don't know what I mean. All right. Uh, how about this one? Hobby chain. Uh, no, let's not do that right now. There's, 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 a, there's a real mood that I'm not trying to fuck up right now by asking a dumb question. Okay, I, 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 I read. I, I get it. Uh, <laughs> I talked to you. All right, this came from Drake's PC. He said, when I post my cards to my pager story, even if they say they are not available, 
I always get DMs asking if they are available or what my price is. Assuming that you get or have gotten similar DMs, how do you reply? Maybe I'm just a terrible person, but I like to fuck with those people and give them hope and then pull the rug out from under them. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't see that. That Okay, that's a twist. So how does this work exactly? So let's say I DM you. You just posted your Mikhail Bridges Immaculate Logo Man autograph, one of one, <laughs> and I slide into your DMs, PSA 8, and I say, hey, nice PSA 8, bud. Uh, is this for sale? <laughs> nice PSA 8, bud? <laughs> the fuck do you say? <laughs> I don't know. You let's diminish just... it down to the grade of the card? Well, I'm trying to negotiate to buy it, so. So if you were like, hey, nice authentic triple logo man, bud. <laughs> How about 50 bucks? It's just a damn authentic. What a piece of crap. By the way, a PSA 8 on a logo man from Immaculate is a very good grade. <laughs> Immaculate well, is some... so hard to grade, I know, from Luca that I own. I'd say something like, oh, yeah, it's a pretty sweet card. Uh, I don't know. What do you think it's worth? Maybe make a sick offer. We'll talk about it. <laughs> and then no matter what you say next, I'll be like, nah. I just say... Nah, or no. That's my favorite. It <laughs> really what, throws people off. What do they do after that? They just laugh and just kind of move on? Yeah, usually. like it's. I'm pretty annoying, so you probably shouldn't <laughs> be asking me this question. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I really like the nah, N-A-H. It really throws people. They're just like, what? You guy? <laughs> <laughs> nah. All right, now reverse it. Now... Mm. somebody dms you and is trying to sell you a card you know mm. hey i know you're a big chris paul collector what do you think about this 2019 prism uh pink pulsar out of 42 i say price question mark and then they give me the price and no matter what they say i say no nah. <laughs> oh my god you're so annoying <laughs> no it's just like i don't is at this point, Chris, I look for ways to be entertained, and this is just like a really easy way to be entertained. <laughs> it's so easy. It's just sitting there waiting for me. Oh my! God. Chris will probably like send them articles and graphs and fucking research papers of why the card's worth X. And no, I've been doing way too. I, I mean, I do. I, I try to be very thoughtful. Like, oh, you know, thank you for thinking of me with this. It, and the player I get this with by. Far the most. Who do you think it is? McCaffrey. Lukic. No. Uh, McCaffrey. Luka. Everybody wants to pawn off their fucking McCaffreys on me. Hey, I got this uh, pink Pulsar out of 42. Okay, so, yeah, give me – what's your answer? What do you do? If it's the one you don't want, but you're, you want to be polite. Well, I'm very nervous about, like, people stop sending me them. You know, I want people to keep sending me them in case one – they mm. stumble into one that I like. You don't want to burn a bridge. No, I don't want to burn a bridge. I don't want to be like, that's a, that's going to be a no for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you basically want to do the opposite of what I do. Yeah, so I'm just like, oh, thank you for thinking of me. Really cool card, but uh, not what I'm looking for right now. That's that's oh. my, uh, my go-to there. God, that's boring. Okay. Jesus. Yeah, I know. I, I don't have a good answer to that question. Yeah, I like to string them along. <laughs> oh, I know. I That's very clear. Uh, okay. This must be why I don't get any DMs. <laughs> uh, looking at questions from our stories right now. Oh, but if someone the... sends me a card that I really want, I get desperate and I'm like, they're my best friend for the day. <laughs> How about this? Do you think LeBron will own an NBA team within the next six years? I'm already really bored of this billionaire stuff. Are you? Yeah. They just did. Tiger Woods a billionaire now. Hmm. Christina just said it. They just did one for Tiger Woods. Yeah. Do you know what it is? It's like LeBron and his PR team, Tiger and his PR team's like, hey, people aren't talking about me enough. Tell everyone I'm a billionaire. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty gross, but us plebs seem to. Get excited when somebody's eight bazillion times richer than us and we talk about it. <laughs> I really hope LeBron doesn't own an NBA team because it can only be bad. Just look at Michael Jordan. <laughs> that, yeah, you, you can't, actually, you can't do worse. That's so, true. <laughs> the Bobcats and the Hornets. <laughs> yeah, you can't do worse. Uh, 
No, I I don't know. It's it's will he? I don't think he will in the next six years. I think he's still going to be playing for four more years. Mm. Four more years. Yeah, he's yeah, pretty. I can see that. He's pretty. I mean, he was like third in PER, fourth in PER, and All NBA third in his twentieth season or whatever. Yeah. All right. So this question was born of a uh, Instagram group chat where. I was summarily destroyed because really? I, I dared to say that hand numbered serial numbers are trash. So oh my God. that set off a few five alarm fires in the night among some nineties collectors. And, uh, but then, you know, this question came in from one of them and I was all too happy to put it to a poll and the poll is a landslide in favor of stamped serial numbers yeah. over hand numbered serial numbers, which nobody is surprised by. So, what's your opinion on hand numbered serial numbers versus serial numbers as stamps on the card? Well, let me let me explain it to you in a way that you'll understand. If you did a poll for Prism Black versus Prism Black Disco, <laughs> it would be a landslide mm-hmm. for Prism Black, but. That doesn't mean that Prism Black Disco is trash. It just means it's less popular. There's less demand for it. It's a little more niche, I would say. But, you know, in the right context, it can be kind of neat. That's where you're wrong. In this instance, it does mean it's trash. <laughs> <laughs> no, all right, look, let me give... Let me give... What's your favorite color, black or white, Chris? Uh... Uh, well, on cards, black for sure. You're just more of a black and white kind of guy. Go ahead, explain to me why it's trash. Black is every color, or is that white? White is every color. That's oh, white. Fuck. Black is no color. I just defeated my own argument. <laughs> why is it trash? You don't like them? I just don't like this. I just this this just feels homemade. This, that's my it's issue just, with this. It's just so insignificant in the totality of the rest of the card. It's just like you're diminishing the rest of the card based on one tiny feature. Plus it can fade. Plus it can fade. I would prefer, I prefer stamp. I'm just saying like, I'm not going to not buy a grand finale because of that. My point. I am. I will save myself the money and I avoid diamond dimensions for that reason. Yeah. Well, um, I do have a fucking hand numbered card in my collection though. So which one, uh, here, let me show you. McCaffrey. The McCaffrey Prison Black. Yeah, exactly. Yep. The uh, is it, honors one, not the true. Is it, is it more interesting when the player does the hand numbering yeah. themselves? Yeah, that's more interesting. It, it, it's least interesting when it's just like some individual who's just on the floor at upper deck, just, yeah. oh, let me go get the Sharpie out of the office and nine, you know. I'm not a big fan of the buyback, which I th- is that that – Christian McCaffrey's a buyback or something? Basically, it came in a product called Panini Honors, which is like a repack product. They went on, you know, they they had an extra copy, which I also hate, of his rookie Prism Black one of one. (laughs) Wasn't wasn't stamped, so he autographed it, put one of one. It is not a rookie product. It's a a second-year product. Right. Well, I I just really like the grand finale design, and I just wasn't going to let that little – I prefer that – I wildly prefer the stamping as well like 99 to 1 I just I really prefer the stamp but I like the grand finale and I, I wanted it in my PC so I wasn't going to stop me well, I really appreciate you coming around to see it my way I'll be letting the guys in the chat know that you also agree with me on everything um, <laughs> you just you just get to fucking use that now <laughs> he's going to take a clip of you saying that and just send it to oh. me okay so we have an important question here this actually came up on Clubhouse You'll be very disappointed that you missed this. In a fight <laughs> between a cowboy and a pirate, <laughs> who would win? Guns can be included or not included. Your call. Mm-hmm. Cowboy pirate. Where, I mean, is the battle at land or sea? Good fucking question. That's a good question. Like upper hand. Who has the upper hand? Good question. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't part of the. Disc- it, it wasn't included. All right, I'm gonna. Yeah, this is like cards. Card dimensions don't exist. Get your brain out of that. Um, 
Well, we just watched Pirates of the Caribbean, and Johnny Depp's on a roll right now, so I'm going Pirates. Nice. Yeah, I went with uh, – at first I was with Pirates because, look, Cowboys, a lot of smoke and mirrors. They seem tough, but the horse does most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> and the guns and, like, yeah, the lasso yeah. and all that shit. Yep. But if there were no guns involved, the – Cowboy is a clear advantage because of what you said, the lasso. That's a distance attack that can completely neutralize the pirate. The pirate has fucking cannons, though. If you have a sword, you can just cut the rope in midair. <laughs> well, you fucking lasso them around the arms. You're Dude, right. my man Orlando Bloom will fuck you up. <laughs> you better be careful. You better be careful what, you, what you're asking for here, guy. When I first met Christina, she had this big-ass poster of Orlando Bloom as a okay. pirate. No. <laughs> No, as an elf. Thank you. As an elf. Not as a pirate. Dude, I, thought, I, I thought you were about to say... It wasn't a poster. It was a cardboard cutout. A life-size cardboard cutout that I got for my birthday. <laughs> like, from That's my epic. sister. <laughs> dude, Orlando Bloom's not a... He's not an ugly dude. Hold on. I thought you were going to say, when I first met Christina, she had a big old pirate eye patch, and I just <laughs> didn't get into that. Yeah. As Legolas, that's who it is. No, yes. he looked like a pirate. He, no, but you're just confusing it because he had long hair and both. But he was, it was definitely Legolas. It was not, um, <laughs> from Pirates. Legolas is, like, definitely a fan favorite. He's my favorite character from Lord of the Rings. So. Amen. Okay, moving on. So he does. He's so regal. He's so boss in that movie. Uh... <laughs> uh, hmm. Here was another question that did come in. We won't dwell on it, but he goes. He, he, he this person says, "Where does hustle rank all time on basketball movies?" It's number one for me. Oh shit! Number one wow. basketball movie. This movie's being hyped for the movie, Chris. It better be good. Yeah, that's a lot of hype. Because I mean, you got Air Bud, you got Coach Carter. There's some real classics you got to beat out. You got Air Bud? Yeah. Hoosiers, Air Bud, same thing. Same level. <laughs> <laughs> like Mike? Oh. Do you know that Kevin Durant's in a movie? We should watch that. Thunderstruck? We should watch that. I haven't seen that yet. It's back when he was in the Thunder. It's probably really bad. Thunderstruck? Blue oh, chip. Wow. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that existed. 2012. Let's go. Kevin Durant. Jim Belushi. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's probably still bad. All right. Uh, we had a question here. Thoughts on PSA opening up value bulk service. Do you foresee another large backlog accruing? Mm, I do not. I do not. I think they, I think they put that into their calculations and they're ready for, for that. The market's dead right now. Less people want to integrate that stuff. I think we'll be. I think it's fine, and it's only for collectors club members. So they have got a bottleneck built into it. Yeah. Plus, like PSA has scaled so much since they shut yeah. down. <laughs> like this company is probably ten times bigger than it yep. was. When they, I'm completely making that number up. I don't know that, but it's right. they've scaled so much. They've got all these new offices. It's just so many new employees. I feel like they're going to get a big flood and they're going to be like, that's it. That's the best you got. Yeah. And also like I was skimming the FAQ. There's plenty of, um, you know, concern addressed about like, will, you know, any right. new stuff get created before the backlog is complete? Like, cause they're still working through the backlog right now, but I'm sure they're getting closer to being done. And like, no, you know, they're still going to complete all the previous orders according to the FAQ before any new bulk service orders get great. Do you that Beckett is through their backlog? I don't know. You sent me that. I thought you said that they were. Uh, I don't know if they are. I, but I, what I, I think I sent you a screenshot about Beckett's new CEO. He said they're through the backlog. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even read my own screenshot. You were just so excited about the NFTs that you glossed over that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Beckett's new CEO is a coin collector turned NFT collector. So... You can one of us. One of us. Yeah, you can imagine how thrilled I was. <laughs> Over at the Hodge house. 
All right. This question came from Billy Hoyle Can Dunk. What are your favorite 90s pair? There's another great movie. White Man Can't Jump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite 90s parallel and why? I personally like First Day Issues and Upper Deck Electric Court Golds. So just for one second, really like the call out of First Day Issues, which is Stadium Club and Upper Deck Electric Court Golds. I believe the first year of First Day Issues was 93 Stadium Club and the first year of Upper Deck Electric Court Golds was 95. Really cool products, unnumbered parallels, but definitely short printed and very low population reports on high grades of those. So cool call. You don't really see too much love given to those. What about you? What are your favorite 90s parallels and why? Actually, this, oh, is, this, is, this is just singular. It's, this is actually, what's your favorite 90s parallel? Just one. Well, I mean, you know where I'm headed to the Rubies and the PMGs. I'll probably say if I had to pick one, I've got a lot of nostalgia for the second year, the 98 PMG, the PMG gold. Some people refer to it. That's, that was my first big purchase. I love that set. Yep. And, uh, you know, here, I'll, I'll put the, the spotlight on one or two parallels that like sticking with this question, like the theme of this question. Yeah. The, the first day issue stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think platinum medallions are really neat. Mm-hmm. They're number two, yep. 100. They, except for the inaugural issue, the 96, 97 platinum medallions were not numbered. Although the box said that the print run was less than 250. Nice. Those are cool. 97, 98 and 98, 99. One was numbered to 100 and one was numbered to like 99 or something. Yeah. 98, 99 is numbered to 99. Yeah. So like those are really cool. And then uh, one of a, the one of a kind parallel, the stadium club came out with the 97, mm-hmm. 98. It was number to 150. Uh, cool card. It's not a refractor finish. I wish that it was, but it is like a cro- an all chrome finish. That's pretty neat. And if you have a shitload of really shiny refractors, like it kind of breaks them up nicely to have those one of the kinds. They're they're more subtle. Dude, how awesome! Just in general, are serial numbered cards from the 90s because it was just like such a new concept at the time, and it just puts your mind at such ease knowing like dude there's only 99 of these fucking things you know it's just it's such a you could we could probably sit here and make a pretty sweet argument that that made as much of an impact on the success of the hobby as grading you know like it's just, it's just a massive massive thing that that changed the game yeah we had a question last week that was fun that was like was grading the greatest marketing technique mm. ever in the hobby or, or something to that effect and like numbered cards gem mint the gem mint the, the gem mint that's right the p with the p yep. t- or the the gem mint grade that's right yep. and like here like yeah i like um i like your point about numbered cards but and, and numbered cards was uh an innovation that arose out of um you know it was a response to the junk wax era and mm-hmm. to mass printing of cards and their and collectors saying, you know, we want chase cards and we want things that are scarce. And so, you know, there was innovation involved. People didn't like it at first. You know, I, I've, I've looked at old Beckett magazines from the mid nineties where there were <laughs> negative reactions, you know, just like when you read a, uh, a post by a hobby influencer today in the comment section is just fucking people hating on everything with, <laughs> the deepest, darkest soul. And even then, the Beckett's letter to the editor section is just full of people. Just, why are there refractor parallels? This is so stupid. This is going to ruin the hobby. Blah, 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 blah. So that, you know, they, they withstood the, uh, they withstood the <laughs> conser- more conservative collectors. And, uh, yeah, par- the, in, the, the advent of, in particular, numbered parallels, super short print number parallels, is so key. And and now it got us to a point today where we have zero of zeros. <laughs> I mean, dude, I was I was gonna go down that path, but like, we don't have one of ones without numbered cards, and one of ones are, you know, it's like the limit of it, right? The the absolute limit. Yep. <clears throat> yep. 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 I totally agree. Started with. I believe 96, someone in the chat helped me out here. 
96 Flair Legacy for basketball was the first serial numbered set. Those are out of 150, the row zero. And that's kind of – and then the credentials from that year are 499. And it just happens to be the Kobe's rookie year. So those are kind of the two serial numbered Kobe rookies, which is important for his legacy of sports cards. Totally. Well, uh, what would you say – if I said that there was a baseball card from oh, – I said basketball. I'm okay. sure there's a baseball one for me. Yeah. Yes, there is. So this is from 92. Ooh. I only know this because uh, of Carter. <sighs> somebody asked to uh, – somebody requested these. This is the 1992 Donruss Elite Ken Griffey Jr., Mm. This was, uh, I believe, an insert set. Maybe I'm not. I'm not quite sure exactly. I don't remember right now. Yeah, there's like 18 cards in the set, so it's a small set, and they're numbered to 10,000. So they have the nice serial number up there. And I, people must have. I, I don't know what people thought. They said there's 10,000 of these things. Right. But, you know, here's the Griffey. Uh, it's about a, an $1,800 card. The PSA 10 is a Pop 44, and. Yeah, it ever since we started tracking it in February, there has not been another ten added. So cool card. Uh shiny it's got the uh Yeah, it's got the finite kind of pattern, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it kind of does, yeah. This card was ahead of its time. This card was ahead of its time right there. Yeah, so are we saying that's the first ever serial number card? I still don't know. I really don't know, but like 10,000 is a very different world from legacy collections number to one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, know, you know how like some older cards you see are, or like in memorabilia, it won't actually, it'll say like, um, you know, one of 8,000 and it won't say the numbers like one of one. And then you just, you just imply, you just like assume that it's, there's only 8,000 of these and it's like a more of a memorabilia type of thing. Yeah. That one, that card there, kind of gives me more of that vibe than it does the modern serial numbering. Exactly right. That's a good. That's a good comparison. But it's a, you know, it's an early attempt at it, an early rendition of bringing about that sort of concept. Yeah. All right. Here's another question from the Instagram story pool. Uh, despite the overall market being down, rare '90s mm -hmm. continue to thrive. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there there's pockets of cards that are vintage eighties and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. There's pockets of cards that are definitely uh doing quite well right now. So yeah, I, I mean you have this whole you have this whole rant kinda of right now brewing in your brain about <laughs> um cards that people are willing to take a loss at right now mm -hmm. or sell short just to get rid of it versus the card that like you know that this is a card that's very sought after by a lot of people and you're going to maximize your dollar and be patient on it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. Uh, not every card is constantly at peak demand. You know, there's different times and moments when cards are more in demand than others. And as collectors, you know, in this hobby, this is largely – this has always been a peer to peer marketplace, even if it's intermediated by an auction house, it's still, mm -hmm. you know, me, the collector deciding that it's time for me to sell a card and then I send it to an auction house and then somebody, some other group of collectors bid on it and one of them ultimately wins. So the, the market force that has always brought cards to markets has been a collector deciding now is a good time to sell. And it's not always that clean. You know, sometimes collectors just need to sell. Life circumstances force them to sell or they're just ready to move on. But there is an, in, an intuition that all collectors have of now is a pretty good time to sell this card versus now is not. It's so like one great example is like, yeah, now is a pretty good time to sell Jalen Brown cards. Jalen Brown is doing well. And in last night's uh, alt auctions, uh, one of the few – higher end cards to exceed its alt value was a Jalen Brown prism gold. It went for about 10 grand and the alt value was like six. Otherwise there was lots of cards in that auction that went 10, 20, 30, 40% or more, 
beneath its alt value. And I funny, funnily enough, the winner of that Jalen Brown Prism Gold DM'd me and it was and he was just like, ah, fuck it, I just took a chance. I just really wanted the card. Like yeah. he felt he felt embarrassed that he was like the only one. Right, right. <laughs> but pay. it's a fucking it's a gold rookie of Jalen Brown. You don't get too many chances to get that card. No, you don't. And now is a time when people are considering collecting this guy. You know, yeah. he's playing fucking really well in the NBA Finals, and he's two wins away from being a champion. So, you know, this is a time when there will be collectors sitting at home who say, man, you know, I like my Jalen Brown cards, but uh, now might be a good time to sell them. And there, so there's always been this natural cycle to the market that, that utilizes collector mm-hmm. wisdom without even trying. It's just something that's inherent in a free market is that information is possessed by all of us little individual atomized collectors. And then we in the aggregate make decisions that usually end up with cards that are in high demand being brought to market and cards that are in low demand, not being brought to market. But, you know, now in a world where um, companies are sourcing their inventory and and they're going out and trying to build up their marketplace by going to shows and trying to strategically buy cards. Well, it, it's it's creating a selection bias because here's what happens: they will offer eighty percent or seventy five percent of comps to dealers. And if you're a dealer and somebody walks up and says, "I'll give you seventy five to eighty percent of the last sale," you're going to say, "Okay, all these cards, all my Jalen Brown cards. There's no fucking way I'm selling you those." at a 20 to 25% discount. But here, you know, my Luca Prism Orange, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll sell that to you right now, and then I'll, I'll take that liquidity, and I'll go do something else with it, because that's just not a card that's in demand right now. It, it might be in six months uh, when, you know, the new season's getting ready to start, but right, right. now, it's just not. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to move on, take a small loss. If I were to send this card to auction right now anyway, it probably would only go for – 85 or 90 percent then the of the last comp the auction house is going to take their juice so let me just sure and then but what happens is you get the selection bias where companies that are sourcing their inventory based on a strategy of buying cards at discounts from dealers are only getting junk inventory and it's similar to an observation that a hobby friend of ours had made about fractional platforms if you have a fractional platform that's going to allow buyouts. Here's what's going to happen. All the best cards are going to get bought out. And all the ones that that are not so popular are not going to get bought out. And then you're just going to have a fractional marketplace filled with cards that nobody fucking wants as a natural Mm. process of the fact that the good cards get bought out. So this is what happens when, you know, we're, we're, and this, this goes to a bigger topic that, has been discussed for hundreds of years in economics, which is the free market economy versus the command economy. And in a free market economy, you have individuals making decisions based on their personal expertise and wisdom. And it sort of all just aggregates into a a wise marketplace. But in a command economy where you have, you know, one big buyer who's dictating what comes to markets you know, based on a policy such as, you know, we want to buy cards at 75 to 80% of comps, all of a sudden, that whole beautiful, competitive free market structure that had worked so well without us even thinking about it, it all gets thrown into disarray. And and it creates this impression that, uh, you know, wow, you know, every card at this auction, the first five pages went for low. Yeah, because it's not natural for those cards to be brought to market right now. And normally mm-hmm. they wouldn't be. They normally they wouldn't be. So, yeah, that's the rant that's been brewing. It's a good rant, man. I, I'm really glad you've been debating <laughs> it. I think it's really, I think it's good stuff. You're teaching a lot of people stuff. The only thing I wanted to add, and while I was listening and absorbing, was um, there's been this like natural growth over the last couple of years of people trying to figure out what are collectible cards. Mm. And we've moved through these like cycles of like base cards, the numbered cards, the parallels. And we're like, keep getting inching closer and closer to what is like the peak of a collectible card. 
And, you know, the Prism Orange is a good example of that, Luca. It's like, yeah, it's a low number in a, in a strong market. That card sells really well. It kind of makes sense. But in a down market, it's like people keep selling that card. There's only 49, and it keeps selling over and over because it's not quite a collectible card. It's orange. It's weird. <laughs> it's only popular because it's low numbered. The I think, you know, no offense to Josh Luber, but the, the out of 500 black, LeBron keeps dipping because it's kind of in that same boat as that Luca. It's like not the most popular parallel. Um, and basically, like, just look at the all auction. That, this, that's the card I'm describing. It's like it's not quite the card that people are locking up in their collection because they're never going to get a chance to get it again. And that's really the next level is like cards that are the mix of all these things. Serial numbered, doesn't sell a lot, it's locked up. Collectors you know, or after this card and there's demand on it from multiple levels. And so we're getting closer. We're at the end of this year. Yeah. And uh, I think alt, the best thing that alt has done by far, in my opinion, is their fund, which has, you know, one of the greatest basketball cards ever made, which is that Curry NT logo man autograph one of one from the inaugural year of national treasures. And I, I get a feeling that if any of like those type of cards come up, Alt isn't buying those and putting them into their auction. <laughs> Alt not. is buying those and putting them into the fucking fund. That's a great fucking point. If it's in the Alt fund or they're just funneling it through their auction, there's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. They ain't sending that Curry NT Logo Man autograph one of <sighs> one to the uh, liquid marketplace. Because they want that thing long term. And it's like you and I know what these cards are. It's the ones that we're not selling. It's the ones that people are not selling. They don't sell because they don't sell. People want them. Yep. I'm getting a lot of weird feedback from you on the web, by the way. When I talk. Hmm. You're like, you're getting like an echo? When I talk, I'm getting like a weird noise. It's stopped now. I think we're good. Try it again. I'm good. We're good. Still good? Yep. Okay, good. So, yeah, all right. Um... Also, like, uh, you know, Alt is here to stay, <laughs> at least, or they're, they're, they're trying to stay. Some great people in the hobby work there, and we're at a point where we've, we've passed the tipping points, and we, uh, it, it's in the best interest of the hobby, considering that they are so well-funded and that they're, they're very, you know, stubbornly insisting on cl claiming their share of this market, that they need to succeed. <laughs> and that's why like, I decided to speak up about it a little bit. It was like, look, you know, I'm just a doofus on Instagram, but I'm going to make a few posts and maybe, just maybe, somebody will hear them and say, hmm, you know, maybe there's something to this. Because cool. it's reached a point where it's like, yeah, I'd really like to, it, it's, it's important that that platform succeed because it's been month after month after month after month of these, you know, bloodbaths in the in the auctions, or at least that's the perception right. that, that's happening. So, you know, we need to maybe as a community sort of collectively address what's going on. And, and there's other things that people take, you know, exception to as well, like the requirement of depositing money up front. Uh, that's just not the way this hobby traditionally is operated. We work on an invoice system where you win an auction, then you have a few weeks to pay, a grace period, and you can send in cards in lieu of payments um, and get, you know, if you win a, uh, a $10,000 card, you know, you, set, you have to send in $20,000 worth of cards to sell in the next auction, and it creates a, you know, a velocity. Um, so, you know, there, there's like, there's lots of things that people, observations that people have made, and... I would just like to request them to review their privacy uh, statement and their terms and conditions because, yep. um, to me, it's not worth becoming a member. Yeah, and that's that's an objection that I have as well is that, uh, you know, I don't want to have to link a bank account. I don't want to grant permissions relating to tracking my personal information. I don't want a customer profile built about me. I should be able to opt out of that stuff. And I should be able to opt out of you literally saying you're going to sell my information to third parties. Yeah. And these are just like consumer opinions that, you know, I mean, look, all can choose to listen to it or not. Uh, but, you know, these are points that uh, pretty serious collectors are making. So, 
yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, I just I'm gonna jump on my same rant that I always have over six years. The rant is that the foundation of the hobby, the success and the future of the hobby is based on genuine interest and people wanting to own these items and collect them. And I use the Larry Fitzgerald example because it's important to point out the genuine aspect of someone wanting to collect their own cards, a person wanting to buy cards that they want for their PC, that they enjoy owning. And, you know, a lot of cards got heavily inflated in value and people didn't necessarily want to own them. They just wanted to, you know, make money on it or prospect on it or invest or whatever this, you know, the term you want to use is. But at the end of the day, the cards that are doing, that are being successful right now, the ones that are going up and auctions over and over are the ones that people actually want to own. There's rich people out there. There's people like us that are collectors. There's people at all different layers. There's cards for at each layer that are collectible for, you know, intrinsic reasons that people want to own them. And I don't know. I just, I always go back to that. And so these cards that keep dipping in value, it's because people don't want them. They're trying to sell them and dump them because they're trying to make money. Bingo. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I think that's a good topic to wrap up on here. Um, anything else that you want to touch on here before we close? Do you want to make any, yeah, how about a, how about a finals prediction now that it's basically a best of three? Mm -hmm. Again, like, I want the Celtics to win. It just seems silly to pick against them if I want them to win. I don't, I'm not some big brain, you know, talking head that thinks I know what's going to actually happen. I, each game is just a surprise to me. I have no idea what's going to happen. That's been a very pleasant part of these finals is that at multiple instances, it's felt like both teams could win thus the series. And I, I, I even saw Nick Wright, your favorite, change his <laughs> I saw him change his uh, his prediction he said the first time this is the first time he's ever changed his series prediction but he changed it from Golden State to Boston after game three I think I wonder if, wonder what he thinks now I'm just not in the business of like you know proclaiming that one team is like superior and they're going to win because then when they lose you just look like an idiot and if they win <laughs> you just move on I I never understood that. <laughs> Taking, I root for teams. I want one team to win and one yeah. team to lose. Yeah, and you know that's good. As long as you've got a rooting interest, that's so key. I think they just make them up. Like I want Curry to lose because of legacy versus LeBron. I've got reasons, so I want the other team to win. Yep. Yep. yep, yep. All right. Well, good show as usual. Uh, nice to have Josh Lubron talk shit about cards with us for like an hour. Let you guys have your little moment about Prison Blacks where I just sat there on the third wheel. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I probably should admit that I, I did. I did. I just fucking come out with it. I texted him. I said, Luber, do you think you could act like you want to come on, wait about 10 minutes and then just say, man, that fucking Jokic Prison Black, that thing is so cool. <laughs> and you're just like, you're just like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Oh yeah, you fuck, you guys are fucking simp's for these prison black. Dude. Where's the Lamine post for you two just drooling on prison blacks? I'm such a simp for the prison black, and I'm just <laughs> I I just wish I would have embraced it earlier. It, it was always in me, you know, but I was always just like dancing around it, just buying like off brand card one of ones. I should just... over the ledge now. You're just gone. I'm gone. It's, it's you're making memes about people dancing or whatever that was. Like what the fuck? This guy's like no turning back. He's just like, oh, oh, is it a prison block? Oh, I don't even care. I don't even care what player it is. I just want it. You're like a PMP green collector now, but for prison black. Yeah, no, I know it's gotten bad. It's gotten really, <laughs> really bad. Everybody in the local chat was so fucking pissed that I got that card because I, yeah, me too. I, I just trashed Curry for the whole fucking series. Just be real. Yeah. Did you tell Christina what I sent you over text? I was like, hey, I know we're friends, and I'm supposed to like pretend like I like all your pickups, but I don't like this one. <laughs> or I don't remember what I said, but it was something like that. Josh, when he told me that like we like that he confirmed the deal and we were going to New York, I was like, Josh is gonna be so pissed. <laughs> oh, and let's just be let's just be like one hundred percent. That was literally my response my my first yeah, response yeah. was let's, Josh is gonna well, be Well let's so just be one hundred percent honest, Christina. You don't like the card either. 
No, I like the the set. I don't like the player. She was like, "Do we have to root for Curry now?" Yeah, that was my yeah. question. <laughs> Do we have to? It's like, don't make me. I don't know why. I like the disco, and I like Prism Black one of one. But like, no, I'm not a fan of Steph Curry. <laughs> Well, she, so, like, Chris was asking me about that card, and I, with no context, and I just sort of was like, yeah, let's just shit on it. And then he's like, oh, by the way, I bought it. I'm like, damn. I was like, what the fuck? I just wanted to get some honest feedback. You got, you definitely got that. You got my, you got my undivided attention on, uh, you know, with no bias. Oh, fuck. Yeah, he was not a nice person. Oh, shit. Spimpin' for the celebrities. <laughs> okay. No, he's not a nice oh, person. God. And Chris told me that I had to take a photo with him. What did you think about Clay? Clay was actually a nice person, but Chris did tell me to take a photo with this him. This is Christina actually happy. This is her fake smiling. Oh, there you go. Okay, okay, do it again. Go back fa go faster. This is a go between fake the smile. Yep, I can see it. This is a fake one. He's got that like this, Chris. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah so I'm fucking crazy. Like, like, the forced yeah. teeth. Like, I'm like, oh my uh, god, yeah. like, can this be over now, please? Oh, you fucking, you're so good, you piece of shit. <laughs> the baby face, the fast, and Steph Curry. What a great, what a great episode, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so glad that we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe the best episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> nice pickup. <laughs> I don't know what Steve really like Max thinks about. I didn't get his opinion yet. Maybe he'll be on my side. If, if you didn't buy that card, I have so many things to make fun of it for. But you did, so I gotta pretend <laughs> like it's cool. <sighs> oh, thank you, Joe. My. Well, of course he's fucking. He's like from San Francisco, rooting mm -hmm. for the Warriors. Come on. Yep. No, Joe is impartial. Joe is not jo impartial. Joe is just an objective collector. Did you, when you bought that card, did, who did you message to get to get your validation that you needed for the, the genius of that pickup? I really had nowhere to go. No, I really had nowhere to go. All the Curry guys that I know just are way over me because I was very hard on him during the Dallas series. I, I, had, nowhere, I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to go. So. Yeah, you're just on an island. On a fucking island. Yeah, Simp Island. <laughs> oh, look, that fucking, about, the, the great Tom Brady collection joined. Well, joke's on you, bud. We're done. <laughs> you know what? I, the only person who's going to be giddy about it was Josh Luber. The Prism Black Simp Group hotline was ready to take your call. You know what? You just gave me a great fucking idea. Double up your money on that card by selling it to him? <laughs> no, a new group chat for Prism Black Simps. Oh, you're welcome. Thank See, you. I got good ideas. It's right. you and Josh Luber, and that's it. But we'll build from there. <laughs> You're gonna have to add in Nebula people. I feel like. Well, I have to because I own a fucking disco, so we have to bring in the next circle of non-true black one of one. What about the shimmers? Well, they can come in too. Is there a person in the world that collects black shimmers only? I, I don't think so. I have one. Christina does have a black shimmer, yeah. And a nebula. And a nebula. Which which one's better? I like the nebula more than the shimmer. Yep, nebula's awesome. Nebula, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like one of them was the other. Yeah, nebula's yeah. nebula's great. Nebula's. I love. Are I love they badass them. looking? The nebulas. Yeah. Yeah, they look amazing. We we pulled one. We pulled two. We pulled a Jalen Hands. We pulled a oh, Hunter. and a Jonathan Isaac. Yeah. 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 The Nebula. Did you rip it in half? Hmm. Did you rip it up? <laughs> no. No, we did not. It, are you fetching your Cleaver Nebula? You don't get that joke. Shimmer. Yeah, about the marketing. Yes, thank you. All right, good. Oh, I mean, can you, it, can you they're cool looking. Dude, remember when that Luca sold for forty grand and the and the hobby went nuts? Yep. 
can we not talk about Dude. that? Because, like, that just it's a sad day for me to remember that card. It went to the right home. It did. I still covet that card, though. I mean, this is a good-looking card, isn't it? I think it is. And then now let's do a shimmer. That ain't bad either. And then let's do the black. All great in their own way. But the nebula definitely hits a little different. That just hits a little different. <laughs> definitely 97, 98 PMG vibes. If you know what I mean. All right. Well, there's, there's a few sales in the past that really stick out of like, oh my God, we're, why didn't we bid on that? The Luca, Nebula, and the Jordan, PMG Green, and Heritage for 900 grand. Those two. They all stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, those are very annoying. Yep, those are very, very annoying. But when that Luca Nebula sold for forty grand, it was like holy shit, forty thousand dollars. And then now it's like, oh my god, why didn't I bid on that? Yeah, we we sold a Luca. Speaking of Prism Orange, we sold a Luca Prism Orange PSA ten for four, like four grand in that auction. <laughs> So for only 10 times that price, you could have got the Nebula. Oh, my God. Yep. But, dude, spend in my world as a fucking lowly law student. Yeah, at the time. Spending 40 grand on a card. Like, that wasn't what did you spend on that Jokic Black? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm a... Oh. <laughs> now, now I'm a lowly... Uh, what, what do I do? I look at numbers like like when luber was on earlier he was like yeah for a year and a half i just cleaned excel spreadsheets but then i had to you, know, you have to do that to move on to better things i was like are there better things <laughs> like i feel like you peaked right there luber <laughs> <laughs> Did it, does it really get better from there no well then we uh, you know you and i were joking that hopefully we don't have anything uh any responsibilities at national and christina ruined our lives but he was like that was my last one. I felt so sad. Now he's got all these meetings and shit. Yeah, it's good that his life is ruined as well. Well, ours are ruined by like two meetings, like any more than zero. And we're like, uh. <laughs> and those meetings better be like on the fucking show floor standing in a corner. <laughs> with like, yeah, yeah. With the person that we're talking to in the meeting in front of what, you know, like the table we're actually looking at. <laughs> Yeah, can we just walk and talk, and I'll be over here looking at cards. And... And Christina's, like, doing this right now. Huh? Like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I already foresee my week at National, like, covering all of your meetings, the both of you. And that, yeah, look, he's already, like, is that an option? <laughs> that sounds good to me. Well, I'm going to, like, Chris and I are both going to do this and be like, you ready? And we'll just run. <laughs> I'll be like, no, 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 here's what we'll do. You know what we'll do, Chris? Since I've learned new things about Christina, we'll go, oh, look it. Is that a Kleber 101 look over there? Look at that. And she'll look and we'll just run. <laughs> I would totally look she for would. that card. Yeah. She would. Too easy. We need to make it harder on ourselves. Like, yeah, make a game of it. All right. Way too easy. Way too easy. You guys are so annoying. I refuse to come on camera today, by the way. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> don't get mad I will not say why I love the call out that Luber had of why are we shoving the athletes that are signing at National in the back behind curtains that's that's a great thought why do we why do they do that just the way it's always been done but yeah like oh Hulk Hogan's here yeah he's off in the corner there's a hundred thousand yeah. other people over here who don't give a shit though <laughs> <laughs> so weird man that's just weird like Nick had to get that footage by like fucking basically being a creep and going behind the, the curtains and like l being taller than everybody. Like, it's just like, why is this so weird? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't the athletes ever just think like, 
hmm, there's a lot of people here. Maybe they prefer to be in the corner so they don't have to deal with all the people. Oh, they definitely don't want to deal with all the people. No doubt about that. Not, not our type of people. They did not. <laughs> <laughs> cool, hey, <whoa. laughs> We should end right now. We have 69 people in here. Perfect. All right. See you guys next week. Nice. We're reaching the top. A lot has changed since Card Ladder began. We started with 500 cards in our database, and now we have over 3 million cards and over 30 million sales. For anyone asking who was the best, we put in our hands up. With Card Ladder's sales history feature, we have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. And you can add a card to your collection with just one click. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Plus, every card, no matter the last time it sold, has an estimated value that we calculated using our state-of-the-art player indexes. Unlike other apps, when you see Card Ladder's verified check mark, that means a researcher personally vetted each and every sale. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder 2.0, constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Card Ladder 2.0.